Good morning, good morning and welcome virtually to For Hamilton Place, the home of the Royal Aeronautical Society here in the heart of London's West End. My name is Dave Edwards, I'm the Society's Chief Executive. It's a delight to have you with us all today for Careers in Aerospace and Aviation Live. I'm from a small village in Mid Wales. When I was 14, I found my aviation inspiration, a farmer called Bob, who flew light aircraft for fun. Without Bob, I wouldn't be here. In reality, I'd probably be working on that farm. So instead, I'm halfway through a career in aviation that's taken me all over the world, running businesses in, jet, uh, in business aviation, special missions, commercial airlines. I've lived and worked in the Middle East, the Far East, North America, and closer to home here in the UK and Europe. The Royal Aeronautical Society has also been part of that inspiration. For 155 years, founded before the first ever powered flight, we've been at the very heart of the debate on aviation and aerospace. We've argued, we've challenged, we've educated, we've provided opportunities. And today we're still doing it. We provide a network across the UK and the world for professionals to meet and help drive forward the agenda on aerospace and aviation. We advise governments globally, we're a key part of the UK's apprenticeship process. We accredit a wide range of university courses all over, over the globe, ensuring they're relevant and deliver to the highest possible standards. We provide thought leadership, addressing controversial topics and working with employers to address the skills gap our, our sector experiences. We are the National Aerospace Library at Farnborough, home of archives of the most important periods in aviation, from letters from the Wright brothers, through test reports on famous airliners, through the very latest research work on cutting edge projects that are used by the engineers of today in designing the next generation of technology for tomorrow. In short, we're here to support our members and partners, but also the entirety of the aerospace and aviation community, particularly the next generation of future leaders and talent. If I go back to my school days, quite a long time ago, I was inspired by Concorde, by NASA's space shuttle and light aircraft like the Europa and the Kit Fox. Now you're in the position to be inspired by ways of continuing to combat climate change, to reach deep space and to develop the next generation of aerospace technology that will just leap us into the future. It's one of the most exciting periods in history for our sector, comparatively similar to the huge developments in technology the last generation saw in the 1950s and the advent of jet engines and direct transatlantic travel. So I'm really pleased that you're here today to learn all about the opportunities that are available to you to progress whether it's in an apprenticeship with a leader in company or a degree from an academic institution that we accredit, or your first job in something so revolutionary that my generation just wouldn't understand it. And so building on that theme of inspiration, today is the 16th Careers in Aerospace and Aviation live event the Royal Aeronautical Society has run. Whilst we can't be with you in person, being virtual won't make it any less useful, insightful or inspiring. We're also able to increase the ability for everyone from all across the globe to attempt, reaching even more people than normal, and really giving you the chance to hear from a broad cross section of our industry about the education and career opportunities we're able to offer. The global pandemic has been one of the worst periods in commercial aviation's history, but there's been continued development in space, defense, and everything to do with climate change technology. So don't believe that there's no future for a career in it. We've had challenges and setbacks before, even within my lifetime, but we've always come back faster and stronger each time. Whilst we might have a few years ahead of us to get back to those pre-pandemic levels, we will get there and we will grow significantly, providing you all the amazing opportunities to get into a dynamic, exciting and rewarding industry where you're able to help change people's lives for the better. Around the main talks, you'll have the chance to visit exhibitors in their virtual booths and speak to them both face-to-face -face and through messaging. You'll be able to learn about future technology emerging in aviation, as well as career transition roles and training opportunities to make the most of the incredible skills and knowledge that our people can offer. Our exhibitors and talks today cover space, defence, green and low carbon solutions for aerospace and aviation, urban air mobility, cyber and digital transformation programmes, commercial and business opportunities in aerospace and aviation, major programmes such as Team Tempest and Net Zero, as well as flight training and operational roles. In short, no matter what your background or what you'd like to do in the future, there's something here for you today. We need you to help us build the aerospace and aviation industry and to help secure COVID recovery and the future sustainability of our planet. 
Our sector has been at the heart of that particular de uh, debate for decades, leading the world with advanced revolutionary technology, something we don't shout loudly enough about, and we'll continue to be at the forefront of that in this decade. We're burning around 80% less fuel than we did 50 years ago. Of course, there's still more to do. Manufacturers and engineers are actively delivering better solutions all the time. We haven't stood still. So learn as much as you can today. Ask as many questions as you want and really search out the opportunities that are there waiting for you. I hope you'll be inspired to join the sector and the society and that you'll all get out of today as much as we encourage you to put into it. And ultimately, I hope to hear your incredible career stories in the years ahead. You are going to write the next chapter, chapter of our history. And finally, I want to thank our exhibitors and sponsors for helping us bring this event to you today, as well as, of course, as to you for attending. The Aviation Skills Retention Platform was formed to help individuals in aerospace and aviation find opportunities that allow them to use their skills both within the sector and also a variety of other industries. Simple and easy to use, it's helped many people over the past 18 months and has been vital in, in COVID recovery for our sector. I'm now delighted to hand over to uh, Richard Smith, director of the platform, to tell you more about it. Enjoy your day. Hello, everyone. Very, very good morning to you. It should be my chairman, Terry Skeeler, speaking to you this morning. Um, but sadly, he's had problems technically, so he can't join us and has asked me to offer his apologies. But I, I'm going to do my best to cover um, the, the ground as well as Terry uh, would certainly have done. Um, but, he, you know, he's really keen to get across as chairman of TRS and of the Aviation Skills Retention Platform, that, that he would have been delighted to have been here to, to celebrate as the aviation industry is beginning to show signs of recovery. Uh, it's good uh, to see planes flying again as we move towards 2022 and a spring recovery. And he's equally delighted to support the aviation um, Minister Robert Courts, who will be launching uh, Talent View Aviation in, in a few minutes. And, and of course, to thank David Edwards, the Chief Executive of the Royal Aeronautical Society, for kindly hosting us here today, uh, as he's done and as the organisation has done now for, for a number of years. Uh, it's been a difficult 18 months, I think, as David's mentioned, but as we move forward towards 2022 with renewed optimism, it is also vital to recognise and continue to support uh, the people whose careers have been interrupted by the pandemic. And, and the Aviation Skills Retention Platform was established to do exactly that and supports people as part of their ongoing career journey. It's funded by the Department for Transport. That's a really important thing to mention here. And, and I know Terry wanted to personally commend the minister and his team for supporting and funding this really important and vital work which continues to gather momentum and remains open to employers and people today. In addition to the aviation skills retention platform, you know, we also offer uh, some funded and fully funded training courses through this platform, again funded by the Department for Transport through the Civil Aviation Authority International, which we know have been uh, very well received by people that have taken these training courses. So, you know, for people who've lost their jobs or been out of work or, or in a position of where they're looking for future opportunities, this is a great place to, to, to come and visit. But today is about our future generation and support offered through Talent View Aviation, launched here today at the Royal Aeronautical Society uh, this morning. Going forward, we will build on the good work from today uh, with another media launch in mid-November to ensure that we maximise opportunities for engagement going forward. Uh, so from today, we're looking for employers, most importantly, to spread the word and above all, use the platform to recruit students into your organisations for apprenticeships, placements, internships, graduate opportunities and related vocational qualifications. Like the Aviation Skills Retention Platform, Talent View Aviation is a free service and it's already joined up with a great number of universities and epic colleges to support aviation uh, going forward. Talent View Aviation will progressively attract young people from universities and colleges towards a great career of potential in aviation as the industry covers in the coming months and beyond. Our work will continue to progress 
as recovery gathers momentum. But as I'm sure you will agree, it's a worthwhile journey to grow and build on the capacity and capability of the industry, both now and in years to come. So I therefore reach out to all employers, universities and colleges on behalf of my team, my chairman, the Department for Transport and, and all involved to, who work across aviation to please join us on this important journey. Uh, and do please come and speak with me and my colleague at the stand today. Um, we, we're going to be on that for, for all, all, all of today. So do please come across uh, and, and, say, uh, and say hello. So uh, again, on behalf of Terry Schooler, thank you all. Um, now, I'm also very pleased to hand over uh, to a, what is going to be a recorded message today from the, for the Minister of Aviation, Robert Corse, who, who also sadly can't be with us. But uh, we're going to pass you over to Robert uh, and his message now. So thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you for allowing me to address you this morning, and I apologise that I can't be with you in person. But it's fitting that we're hosted today, albeit virtually, by the Royal Aeronautical Society. Not only the oldest such society in the world, but the only professional body anywhere dedicated to the aerospace community. For well over 150 years, the Society's contribution to aeronautical advancement has been immense. It sponsored the first ever wind tunnel, designed by Wenham and Browning in 1870. It supported industry breakthroughs such as the aerial steam carriage, a key transition moment from glider to powered flight experiment. But arguably its most important contribution was the establishment of a technical department during the Second World War. At a time of national crisis, the department helped to expand the aircraft industry, pulling in engineers from all backgrounds and teaching them the sector specific skills they needed to contribute to the war effort. So it's appropriate, I feel, that we are hosted by the society today as we look to protect the old as well as attract the new skills that will sustain this vital industry. And I want to make three points today. Firstly, the importance of the aviation industry. Secondly, what we're doing to protect skills and attract talent. And finally, how we can address some long term challenges for the sector. Now, as Minister for Aviation, you'd expect me to talk about how important the industry is, Wish we know but the numbers speak for themselves. As the most successful and flourishing uh, sector, aviation has provided over £22 billion to our economy, employing over 230,000 people. In fact, in 2018, it was forecasted that 435 million UK passengers could take to the skies by 2050. It will come as no shock to anyone here today that the aviation sector was hit harder than most by the COVID-19 pandemic, with a reduction in travel taking its toll on flights and employment. And our priority has been to support a return to a thriving industry. We've supported financially with around £7 billion worth of taxpayer support, but we've made other interventions as well. And that brings me on to my second point. Just nine months ago, I addressed the industry to announce that the Department for Transport was teaming up with Talent Retention Solutions to launch the Aviation Skills Retention Platform. The platform matches skilled aviation workers who've been made redundant or at risk of redundancy with industry jobs. It's been a resounding success, with almost a thousand open vacancies, ranging from pilots to security officers, from cabin crew to data handlers. We have over a thousand individuals registered and more than 80 companies signed up spanning the breadth of our global and far-reaching sector. But we're not stopping here. We must future-proof our industry, ensuring we have the right talent and skills for the next 10, 20, even 50 years, preserving UK aviation's world-leading status. And that's why we're here today, to update you on the latest addition to the Aviation Skills Retention Platform with the launch of Aviation Talent View. Now, many of you here today will be school leavers in further education, recent graduates, or even those who wanted a career change. Aviation Talent View has been designed and tailored for you. The aviation industry can be a competitive place, but Talent View will enhance support for people entering the industry at all levels. You'll see graduate roles and placements across the sector and be able to upload a unique profile 
showcasing your skills and experience so employers can contact you. It's a great opportunity to explore the vast opportunities throughout the sector. So I encourage you, sign up today and you may just find the job of your dreams. I'd also urge you to attend the Aviation Talent View virtual stand today. Go and speak with our representatives about what the industry can offer. And to industry representatives here today, my ask to you is simple. Help us equip the UK aviation sector with the talented workforce that we need for the future. Please share as many vacancies as you can and on the platform as many as possible and make Aviation Talent View your go-to place when you hire graduates, apprentices and other entry-level roles. My final point is around addressing some longer-term challenges for the industry. There are clearly barriers to a career in aviation. The department recently published research to understand how young people perceive the industry and it pulled no punches. Many young people are concerned about entering the industry due to the long training time or simply a lack of knowledge around different opportunities that exist within the sector. The most saddening findings, however, were people who said, aviation is not a career for me. There are hundreds, if not thousands of people in the UK who aren't in the aviation sector, not because it's not an exciting and fulfilling place to work, but simply because they couldn't see the range of opportunities within this dynamic industry or how they could get involved. It's a shame because whilst this industry has a rich history, it's an exciting future too, full of challenge and opportunity. These future planes could be powered from sustainable fuels generated from household waste. We've seen the UK send the first hydrogen battery powered flight into the sky, the first of its kind anywhere in the world. And our ambition, certainly within my lifetime, is to be able to fly to New York on a zero emission flight. But we need a young and diverse workforce to achieve these aims. A workforce that thinks differently, disrupting, challenging the status quo. That's why our Reach for the Sky initiative aims to reach out to these underrepresented groups, address the gender imbalance and help remove the financial and social barriers that put people off. We want to make the aviation sector more accessible, more inclusive and diverse. It forms a key part of our pandemic recovery plan. The Talent View Aviation platform will absolutely help, but we need to go further and further. Industry and government must first seize and then solve this problem together. Now, let me end by reiterating this government's commitment to getting this industry back on its feet so it can help deliver the economic recovery we need. But also, our commitment to safeguard this industry's future, preventing an exodus of talent today, whilst also attracting the talent of tomorrow. Thank you again for letting me speak today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. So good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, just to let you know, we're running slightly ahead of schedule. So our next talk from Boeing is due to take place at 10.30, so around 10 minutes time. But just to introduce myself, my, my name is Nick Davis and I'm the event lead today at the Royal Aeronautical Society. So uh, please do drop me a message, connect with me, um, and I'll be sort of sitting in these talks all day in the background, acting as sort of the supporter. Um, but yeah, just to let you know, just another few minutes and we will start the, the next talk. So please do go and interact with the platform. Please do go and have a chat to all of our exhibitors. So if you click on the virtual careers fair um, in the navigation tabs, you'll be able to have a chat and go in and out of the virtual rooms with uh, all of our exhibitors. So please do go and check them out. But the next talk from Boeing will take place in around, <coughs> excuse me, in around 10 minutes time at 10.30. Thank you.
Hi, good morning, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join not only this, this session, but the event overall. And thanks to Nick and everybody else for organizing and inviting Boeing along to be part of it. It's really, really great to be here today. So my name is Brian Sinclair. Uh, I'm the, uh, I look after the early careers programs here in, in Boeing, the uh, graduate and intern programs. And I'm going to talk about the endless uh, sky of possibilities here at Boeing uh, if you joined one of the early careers opportunities uh, in Boeing UK and Ireland. So let me talk you through kind of the, the content today. So Boeing is, as, a, as a company overall ha, has been, uh, well, has a long-standing relationship with the British industry, the armed forces and the air transport industry dating back uh, more than 80 years in the UK. So nearly 400 Boeing airplanes are operated in the UK. There are more than 120 Boeing Chinook, Apache, Poseidon and Globemaster aircraft providing battle-winning, life-saving capability to the UK armed forces. Um, today, the UK remains a, a critical, important market, supplier base and a source of some of the world's most innovative technology partners uh, to Boeing UK. So that's a short introduction to Boeing UK in Ireland. Looking at Boeing as an employer, so in 2019, Boeing won the best in engineering amongst the top 100 employers for school leavers. Uh, many Boeing employees are veterans or active reservists. We're proud to be holders of a gold award in the Armed Forces Employer Recognition Scheme and active supporters of the Armed Forces Covenant. Uh, Boeing employs apprentices, graduates and paid interns from more, than from more than 50 universities across the UK, universities and schools across the UK. Uh, once completed, the internship program creates a pipeline into the graduate program, aiming to create future managers and technical leaders within the, the company. So lots of opportunities, no matter what your route is into the UK, into Boeing UK. So just a kind of a, a, a snapshot of Boeing in the UK, again, as an employer. So uh, we have uh, three kind of key sites quite proud of. Um, so RAF Lossiemouth is a joint 100 million investment with the uh, Ministry of Defence. So it's a base for nine P8A Poseidon aircraft. It's a hangar training and squadron accommodation there in RAF Lossiemouth. Uh, offers 650 jobs and 480 personnel. So quite a busy site. Boeing Sheffield is the first manufacturing site in Europe uh, for Boeing. It's a 40 million investment. It's 6,200 square meters. So quite a quite a big site. Uh, and produces components for the 737 and the 767 series. Series. Uh, and raw materials are sourced in the UK as well for that site. And then we have down in, in, in Gatwick, we have a Boeing Training and Professional Services. So it's a new 88 million hangar that's been under construction. Uh, the Gatwick Center is the, is the largest Boeing training center campus outside the US and we simulate it as a space for more. So it's a growing site uh, as business grows in the UK. Uh, we also have relationships with a number of key universities. So Strathclyde, Sheffield, University of Cambridge, Cranfield, Bristol and Southampton dotted around the UK. So quite a quite a lot of sites, quite a lot of activity in Boeing UK, of course, you, you, the map there. Next is looking at uh, how we recruit. So the kind of things we do uh, in, in the selection process, we do uh, engagement days in, in Boeing. So what they are is a chance for you to find out more about each other. So it's a two-way selection process. It is as much about you choosing Boeing as a potential employer as it is about Boeing choosing you as a potential employee. At these engagement days, you get a chance to demonstrate your style, demonstrate your team collaboration skills. You get to give an individual approach to kind of why you want to work here, what you offer, why Boeing is right for you uh, to the presentation. Uh, and there's a chance to speak to some of the current interns or graduates or apprentices about what it's what it's really like to work at Boeing. So quite an interactive day is where, we, where we kind of help you decide if Boeing is right for you as much as we decide if you're right for Boeing. Um, what we ask if you are coming to an engagement day, come as yourself. We want to see the true, authentic, whole you um, as part of the selection process, not just the kind of the version you think we want you to be or kind of disguise yourself in any way or kind of hide some of your kind of behaviors or traits. Be honest, be yourself, and we'll hire you for that and enjoy you for being that sort of employee in the organization. Be curious and find out more about us, the people you meet and the business. Um, you know, show you have a desire to learn and to grow. So this is going to be a lot steep learning curves in the Boeing, any kind of grad or intern or early careers program. But we think that's a good thing. If you're learning a lot over a short space of time, that's much better than not learning much over a long period of time. Um, you want to get to know us, what you want to want from us, ask questions. We do ask you to research us in advance so you know know why you want to join, what areas of the business you're interested in, what are we doing at the moment, how can you get involved and support. Um, and then know kind of yourself, what you want to grow and develop so you are um, you know, the ideal candidate for us. So we know what your starting point is as well and we can work together to build on that and realize your full potential. Moving on. 
So what, what do we require for what programs? You have an apprentice program, a graduate program, and an internship program. Let me talk about each of those in turn. So the internship program, this is either, we have placements of either three, six, or 12 months every year. Um, they kind of help you to measure skills, help with development, and give you kind of real responsibility. So the, the real roles, real tasks, they're not coming in to just do little pet projects or sideline tasks. You're given some real work to do, so you really kind of get to learn on, on your feet. You are part of the team. You're fully integrated with the organization, with the, the membership, uh, the uh, leadership in the organization as well. So you get to be kind of fully integrated and fully involved, and not just someone who's only there part-time and treated as such. You're there for the, for the, for the, for the full whole. Um, and there's lots of opportunities for community outreach, networking, and development seminars. So there's more than just doing your day job. Boeing is keen that you get out and support the community around them which you operate in. So it's quite a nice opportunity to have a more of a varied role and more kind of wider level of activities across the organization. Just so you know, though, we don't sponsor us for, for visa applications for the UK. Um, so if you are interested in joining us, we do require you to have the, the, the right to work in the UK already. Uh, and equally, we do need you to have the, the right level of secure, uh, an ability to get security clearance because a lot of our work, as you mentioned, is with the Ministry of Defence. So it's one of the key requirements we ask for when, when applying. Um, in terms of the, um, in ter the terms we have them in, in business, IT analytics and engineering more broadly. So in business, you can do uh, finance, supply chain, project management, business improvements. There's a range of roles. When we do advertise them in, in, in a few weeks, you have to see them on our website. Um, and they're based, of course, in the Bristol, Gosport, London and Frimley. IT analytics is typically down in Bristol or Fleet. And the engineering, again, quite a broad spread, though it's sometimes the odd role in Northern Ireland as well. But again, quite a broad range of opportunities. Wherever you're particularly interested in, you know, have a look at internships, and I'm sure there's something there for you. The grad program is a little bit different. This is a two-year program. Um, it's four times six one placements. And the placements are located across the UK and you receive kind of some assistance in kind of moving between the placements if necessary. Um, you be applied and you'll be accepted into one of the functional programs, uh, but there's an opportunity to complete a rotation outside of your chosen function. So if you joined engineering, you might be able to do a, a rotation, one of those six month rotations in um, project management, for example, or IT. Um, as part of the program, we also offer professional credit, uh, accreditation or certification. So you might do CIPS if you're in supply chain, you might do CMA if you're in finance, etc. There's a range of kind of professional qualifications you can study towards as part of the program. Ideally, you build your technical and fundamental business skills throughout the program to so become a more rounded future leader. And there's an opportunity to experience placements in different entities across the UK business. So you might join uh, and be in BD UK, then go work in some of the commercial side as well. So again, you'd be a real part of the team and contribute to projects and drive profitable growth. Um, and also have opportunities for community outreach again, networking events and development seminars. We just had a fantastic uh, graduate welcome event. Uh, where all the grads kind of met each other and got to know each other, uh, did some team building, did some kind of training, did some education on, on, on the company as well, but just be able to connect with each other. And we also recently had a very, you know, it was an amazing apprentice graduation where some apprentices who've completed their training all got to celebrate and sip a bit of champagne and celebrate with some of the kind of key leaders of the organization, their success in, in Boeing so far. Um, in terms of um, where we have this, the programs, again, supply chain engineering, project management information, they're kind of dotted around the UK, different locations. Uh, so wherever you join, you can join in one location and you can kind of look at moving to another one um, as part of the, the program. So you're not stuck in one place or one role as well, which is quite nice. Then onto the apprentice programs. So these are for people who leave school and want a more vocational kind of route into kind of career success. So here we're committed to giving individuals the opportunity to learn skills in a practical business environment whilst gaining professional qualifications and experience. All of our schemes will give each candidate the skills and knowledge to equip them with the tools to succeed, whether it's a kickstart your career or actually changing it as well. So it doesn't mean leaving straight from school. If you're kind of not sure what your career, where your career is going and you want to have a refresh, come talk to us. The apprentice program is for you too. In the UK, we have multiple schemes across three of our kind of business entities. Uh, and there are some minimum entry requirements and it does differ per scheme. So do have a look at those when applying, when considering for the applications for one of our apprentice programs. Um, the two main ones we have, uh, well, two of them is, first of all, is aircraft maintenance technicians. So they're based across Cardiff, Bryce Norton, Boscombe Down and Lossiemouth up in Scotland again. Um, we partner with the International Centre for Aviation Training, ICAT, to train the apprentices in maintenance for military and commercial aircraft. And the aircraft maintenance apprentices also have a short work experience placement at Cranfield University to gain their A and B engineering licenses. So quite a full-on programme. 
uh, machining technicians. So this is again a three-year program looking at level three and level five-year degree apprenticeships um, based mainly in Sheffield. And again, we work with the AMRC in Sheffield and apprentices um, in aircraft fabrication become fully qualified machinists producing accuation parts for commercial aircraft at our Boeing Sheffield factory. So quite a detailed program and quite a high level one as well. Moving on, we also have simulation technicians. So these are training to maintain pilot flight simulators at Crawley uh, is a training campus we have down there near Gatwick Airport. Um, it's a two year apprenticeship culminating in on the job training alongside apprentice NVQ and an engineering HNC to on day release at college. Um, so again, quite a fantastic opportunity to work on those, these you know, very innovative, you know, uh, simulators that were quite, quite quite amazing piece of tech actually uh, and also we'd have some HR and business support kind of apprenticeships as well so these take part in rotational programs just to gain that wider experience alongside essential theory and um, the HR receive a CIP level, level five intermediate certificate in human resources and the business they achieve a level two in customer services they're based kind of either in London or in Sheffield predominantly um, so that's the, the the two the four main apprentice programs we have in Boeing UK so just basically what we have in terms of this more broadly across the early careers community. So this is just more the options to get involved. This is whether you're a grad, intern, or an apprentice. There's some actual activity that gets on. We have some Lean 1A, you get part of the joint, the Lean Ambassador Program and get trained in, in Lean certification. Um, we do some LinkedIn learning and a variety of kind of training courses that are delivered by Boeing as well, um, either part of the early careers community or through internal kind of wider Boeing resources. Um, we have a professional um, personality assessment, so you can get to know yourself and your skill set. Um, we look at things like mindset and empowerment, so well-being and how you're doing it and looking at the whole you, not just how you're doing as, a, as, as, as an employee, but as a person too. Um, and the personal branding, so you get to know and position yourself as you progress your career. There's, you know, we talk about what are you good at, but also what are you famous for? What are you really, really good at? And can you call out and be the, the go-to person for as early on in your career as possible? We look at effective communications, and this isn't just the ability to write emails or to do presentations, but can you listen as well? Do you have that two-way communication skill? Can you understand what the person is actually really saying? Can you read between the lines and get that kind of emotional connection, that empathy as well? So effective communication is not just effective in business writing, but also in human interaction. Um, and then we also look at social issues within the business. So there's also kind of the community activity that goes on, where if there's something that's kind of raised up by some employee and they want to push it, Boeing will support them. Um, a number of the interns, they started a green team last year. So they were very passionate about sustainability and green initiatives. So they kind of set up an intern team that became a part of the early careers, which is now connected to the wider Boeing green teams, sustainability teams globally. So if you have a passion or interest in something, um, you can bring that to Boeing as well. Um, of, of course, I'm very happy to have that. Um, and just to end, I'm going to give a couple of examples of some of the kind of recent interns and, and people who've joined the organization um, and what they've kind of done and what their thoughts were, just to bring it to life a little bit more. Um, so first of all, we have Anna. So Anna has said here that being part of the Inter program has quite literally made her, her open her eyes um, and wake up, allowed her to realize how big the industry is, and it is quite a large industry, um, how many different career paths are available, and more importantly, has taught her about herself as well. Um, so she's actually now come back and joined us as a grad in 2020. So I had the pleasure of meeting Anna a few weeks ago at that graduate welcome event. So Anna is a welcome attorney to the business and um, doing fantastic as far as I know already. We also have um, Selena. Selena joined uh, a couple of years ago, 2018, I think. Um, it's now part of the grad program um, and has made you know, just the program made her rethink her career, new career paths, um, and look at all the transferable skills. So she learned more about herself during the program as well, not just about the role she was doing. Selena has gone on to some fantastic things already in, in Boeing UK. And then we also have Ollie. Oh, he's a great guy. Ollie is, is, is just my go-to person for a number of kind of admin questions. He's really kind of been really helpful. So Ollie joined um, as one of our graduates, uh, is, is a year in and is having a very successful career so far. So a lot of response was given to, to, to Ollie up front. Um, lots of decisions that, that really empowered him throughout the, 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 the program. Um, and he enjoyed being part of the graduates as well. So he's just a really kind of good guy. He takes on a lot of kind of activities across the grad program. Um, and again, my go-to guy for a lot of uh, queries on um, admin and things, the way, way things work around here is, is really fantastic. Um, and then lastly, we have Amy. So again, Amy uh, was joined in 2008, um, you know, had a fantastic kind of career so on the program so far and has since graduated on. So Amy is now taking a permanent role on our E7 program 
after the grad scheme uh, as a program coordinator. And I believe she's about to join us a new business analyst in Boeing Defense UK. So quite an eventful and successful career for Amy so far. So that's just a couple of ideas, a couple of examples of some of the people who've joined the organization and where they've gone on to so far. Um, we do take in a large number every year. Um, so there's that, that's a growing cohort of people you can join and, and be peers with and also have kind of as mentors and buddies for your career as you progress to join Boeing as well. And then just lastly to sum up, so yes, you can kick off your career or you can kickstart a new direction depending on what you want to do for when you graduate or you can try, try, try this for an internship or come join us, you know, as, as a school leave apprentice or someone later on in life who wants to kind of change their career path. And be part of something with real consequences. There's a lot of what we do has a real impact on the society around us. Be empowered to make decisions. So you get that rotational option on the grad program and you get a chance to move around locations, even on the apprentice program. So really is kind of your career is in your hands. Um, you get the unrivaled experience of industry and Boeing's business. So again, quite a leading position in the industry for Boeing, fantastic place to start your career. Um, you gain those professional qualifications either on the apprenticeship program or on the grad program, even some of the interns start studying towards professional qualifications as well in some cases. Um, and yes, it opens the doors to a global business. Boeing is a very much a global organization with something like 160,000 employees worldwide. So it really is a fantastic opportunity to could come join us in the UK, in Lossiemount, in Crawley, in Gatwick, wherever it is, Sheffield, and then kind of go on onwards and upwards. Uh, your, your career is kind of open to you globally when you join someone like Boeing. Um, so if you are interested, please just go to uh, just search Boeing UK for either Boeing UK graduate or Boeing UK intern or Boeing U apprentice. Uh, you come to our careers website. You can find out more there. And if you're interested, if the roles are open, apply for roles uh, in Boeing UK. And I'd love to see all you there. I'll be on the forum today, the, the, the forum today for more questions. If you have any for now, thank you very much. I will hand you back to Nick. Thanks very much, Brian. So um, really great, thank you. So yeah, please do go and have a chat to, to Boeing on their virtual stand. Um, Boeing are our headline supporter this year. So really, really do appreciate that from, from Boeing. And thanks ever so much, Brian. Um, do check out their talk later on this afternoon. So we've got Isabella from Boeing who's joining the team, who's going to um, have a chat with you all later on. But moving on to our, our next speaker of the day, so um, with, without further ado, I'll, I'll, hand, I'll hand over to Paul, Paul Flower, who is from Safran. So Paul, I'll let you introduce yourself. So I'll just pop you up. All right. So um, my name is Paul Flower. I work in Safran Electrical and Power in the UK, mostly doing electric and hybrids, engines and motors. So that's the, the main subject of my talk today. But before that, I thought I ought to do a brief introduction to Safran UK, since I I certainly wasn't very familiar with it when I joined there, and it uh, flies a little bit under the radar, to um, steal a phrase. So, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. So Safran's a very big company globally, about 80,000 employees. Even in the depth of the pandemic, we're still doing 16 billion euros of sales. And we've got a very large R&D program. So, you know, around 10% of um, income goes as R&D. 1,200 patent applications, 2019, varies a bit year to year. I've been involved in quite a fair number of those, actually. And the, the Safran R&D budget is overwhelmingly dedicated to reducing the environmental impact of air transport. Um, and there's a big focus as well on equal opportunity and inclusiveness, partly, if nothing else, because when we're working new things, if everyone thinks the same, we're going to have real struggle moving there. So it's a, something that's really baked into the, the company. So who are Safran and what are they in the UK? So we're a, a tier one aerospace supplier. So Boeing, just heard from, they're an airframer and they buy big sus subsystems from companies like Safran. Um, we've got around 3,000 people in the UK. We spend a couple hundred million pounds in the UK supply chain with a large number of suppliers. And we've got several sites. Um, we're gonna do a quick run through the different Safran companies in the UK next. So starting with Safran Landing Systems. So they're a world leader in aircraft undercarriages, braking systems, design, manufacture, repair, overhaul, all happens in the UK. And there's continual investment in making cheaper, lighter, um, systems 
and also things like um, electronic taxi systems, electronic braking, um, which I work with as part of Saffron Electric Powers. There's a lot of collaboration between the different Saffron companies. Um, On to Saffron Seats. So Saffron and North Sparkle Zodiac merged a couple of years back and Saffron Seats comes from that heritage. Um, and it's large, a big chunk of it is in the UK. So you've got a Centre of Excellence in Cumbran in South Wales for engineering, design, assembly, and another site in Brackley for design and test. And it's world leader in particularly first class business type seats. Um, a bit of a running theme here as well that all of the, the Saffron companies, while they have UK sites, they also have sites around the world. And Saffron are very keen on internal mobility. So it's not unusual that people will either move between sites internationally or just work with them. So I work a lot with half a dozen sites in France, for instance, and another one in the US. So moving on to Saffron helicopter engines. In the UK, we've got the maintenance hub for the pretty much all the engines in Europe. Um, Saffron helicopter engines, I, I, I personally work directly with the guys in, in France on that, but there are one of the world leaders for helicopter engines and again there's a lot of research involved in improving the design and particularly hybridization which is what i'll come to in a little bit um saffron nacelles in burnley have been doing so for those of you who may not be familiar with it, the cell is what's wrapped around the outside of a jet engine so you don't have all the bits and pieces hanging in the breeze um and in the uk we assemble and to some extent, design the nacelles. And again, multiple different sites across different countries. So Saffron Electrical Components has only recently become part of Saffron. And this is about electrical protection components. So switches, fuses, um, contactors, etc., And also to some extent fluid transfer on an aircraft. So we go the whole range from you know, complete engines, whether it's helicopters or aircraft, down to individual switches, contactors, etc. Um, Saffron Aero Systems is um, similar to seats as part of the inside of the cabin. So things like evacuation slides, piping for the toilets, oxygen, trolleys. It's all done here. Um, and it, mo it mostly maintenance, repair and overhaul. So obviously, once it's manufactured, it'll be in service for 30 plus years. And without support from people like Saffron Air Systems and Braintree, you would have serious problems. There we go. Um, so Saffron Electrical Power, pit zone, that's where I personally work. Um, we're a market leader on aerospace equipment. So particularly the electrical systems on aircraft. So as you're probably aware with it you've got your seat back tv you've got your ovens you've got all the other electrical systems and saffron electrical power provide the whole channel for that pitson in particular is concentrating on generation and increasingly propulsion motors as well and that's going to be the focus of my talk later once we've given you a whistle stop to around saffron uk so for r t within the uk and i work pretty much purely in r t we've got two key objectives Firstly, is reduce the environmental impact of our products. Aerospace is a high profile industry for that. We've got COP26 going on at the moment. And if we don't improve things radically, we're going to be out of a job. So it's a key priority for Saffron. And that's where most of the quite large R&T funding is going. And obviously, we're in interested in improved competitiveness. But that's, you know, it's a key objective, but it's probably secondary to the environmental impact. So what are we trying to do? Weight reduction. Very simply, the less you've got to carry around, the more efficient an aircraft is. Faster development life cycle. One thing we're seeing a lot is that people are trying to accelerate the life cycle thing. You know, much more Silicon Valley type approach to everything. You've got various um, new electric flying things about, but they want to test things immediately. Um, and that's something no one in aerospace has ever really done before. And new forms of mobility, which ties in very closely to that where we're either hybridizing engines or going to pure battery electric propulsion and that has huge implications because it's probably the biggest change in aerospace since the invention of the jet engine we're also working on advanced manufacturing techniques additive manufacturing which is 
really a key enabler for a lot of the other things like weight reduction and for new forms of mobility and advanced testing. So up to very complex systems, we can tr test an entire propulsion system on the ground and pretty much give a fully tested, fully ready to go system to an airframe. And that's something Sakran's very much involved in is going from, you know, maybe an ele a, a non-propulsive electrical channel a few years ago to a full um, electrical propulsion system in the near future. So what is electrical hybrid propulsion? So it's very rapidly coming to dominate aircraft design, starting with light aircraft simply because they're easier, they're typically shorter range, and it's much easier to do with battery alone or with a small hybrid. So that picture there is the Volterra Casio, which has recently been flying around, did a tour of the UK, and the motors on there, it's shown there, were designed and built at Safran Pitstow. Um, it's very, very high priority for Safran as a group. We're getting attention directly from CEO type level. And now battery power obviously gives the potential for a completely emission free flight, plug it in on the ground, charge it from green power. But for um, long range aircraft where it's not yet practical, you still get big, big savings in fuel burn. Very simply, on a normal jet engine, turbofan, you are sizing it for the climb. And then during cruise, your um, power demand is much lower. If you hybridize it, put an electric motor on it, you can size the thermal engine for cruise. And when you need to, for takeoff, you provide a boost from maybe a battery, maybe an auxiliary power unit. That means that your cruise fuel efficiency is significantly improved. Another big change we expect to see is a major saving cost per flight hour, mostly for the smaller aircraft. So very simply, you've got a piston engine, every 100 hours needs an inspection, every few thousand hours you need to take it pieces, put it back together again. It's got hundreds of moving parts. There's a lot of work to do. An electric motor is typically one moving part and it's got um, onboard monitoring and perhaps the only thing you'd ever actually have to change is the bearings, two parts and it goes back again, it's good for another 5,000 hours. That has a huge impact on cost per flight hour, particularly as battery power is very cheap compared to fuel. Um, and the other issue that is probably not very widely appreciated is simply safety due to increased redundancy. So for instance, if you've got a helicopter, if the main rotor falls off, that's fatal for everybody on board. On an eVTOL aircraft, you might have got 16 propellers. If a single motor falls off on that, you've still got 15 and there was balance so you can run with perfectly safely and go into land. And that's actually a, a certification requirement from EASA for the newer AVTOL. So it's really a, a step change in aircraft design that we're just going through the start of. It's really, really interesting. So propulsion motors themselves. Um, that's one of the, the Safran propulsion motors in the ingenious range. Again, that's a, a pitstone motor. They're very, very light, around a, a quarter of the weight of a equivalent pit, piston engine. Single moving part, very long time to an overhaul, which makes them very, very cheap to run. Um, we're seeing a huge variety of motor architectures and aircraft integration out there. Any number of motors, they might be direct drive, they might have gearboxes, belt drives. And we, this was still at a very, very early stage in the development of electric propulsion. There's no dominant configuration there as yet emerged. and all the people who are, they build something, they go, oh, that didn't work, that didn't work, we'll change it. We're seeing a lot of startups and companies new to aviation moving into the sector. So we're seeing a lot of innovation, new concepts. Many of them are very good. Many of them are um, not. And it it's, keeps us on our toes, but it's really very interesting, the rate at which things are changing. It's a very exciting place to work at the moment. Moving, so... Smart motors, this is something that is a very big thing for Safran and it's very challenging, but very interesting. So very simple, an electric motor, you need an alternating current supply to cause the motor to turn. If you just applied direct current for a battery without some form of commutator, it'll sit there. Now, normally this is done with an inverter separate from the motor with maybe a couple of meters of shielded cabling. That adds a lot of weight and complexity for the airframer since they'd ideally just want to plug it into the battery, bolt it on and, and go. So a key technology and differentiator for Safran is what we call smart electrical machines. 
So that's an example of it. You've got the motor in there, but you've also got all the power electronics, all the control electronics in a single combined unit, which is brilliant for the airframers, but it's both challenging and interesting from a, an engineering point of view, because we work, it's a massive cross-disciplinary challenge. Yeah, very simple. Power electronics don't like being hot and they need to run much cooler than the machine. So there's a lot of work integrating it. It's a really fascinating place to work at the moment, simply because of the, the nature of the challenges are all very new. And you know, it's not just a simple, oh, we need mechanical engineers or electrical engineers. There's electronic guys, control guys, systems guys, all across the, the spectrum. And so we're looking for a huge number of different skills to work on this. Um, so for serious hybrid propulsion, so the, the top image is of a test bed in France using a very small generator. So that's a, an APU gas turbine and motor on there. And each of those motors is run purely from the power of the, the gas turbine. So this is aimed at larger, longer range aircraft. So, you know, typically short range, 50, 100 miles. Battery is everything you need for today. For the future, longer range aircraft, potentially, you know, intercontinental range, they're going to be um, series hybrids of some sort or supported, hybridized somehow, whether that's hydrogen, sustainable aviation fuel, we're going to need electricity from somewhere. And particularly the, the smaller aircraft, you get a lot of benefits from distributed propulsion where you've got perhaps a blown wing. So the De Heer Eco pulse under there, you've got motors on the tips, which um, act like winglets on the tip vortices, and you've got other motors along the wings providing a sort of blown effect on the wings. You get much more lift at low speed. And also, you know, very simple, you've got motors on the wing tips. They give you your authority. You can reduce the, the rudder, improve the efficiency of the machine because you've got less wetted area. Now, there's a few demonstrators already flying. Others are going to be flying very soon, like the, the like I said, the De Heer Eco Pulse there, which uses saffron and motor and generator system. And it's also a stepping stone to full electrification. So batteries are still fairly heavy. We're not quite there yet, but we can put a hybrid system in there. It acts like a super battery and it lets you test the airframe and develop it even prior to the um, battery being available. And parallel hybrid propulsion is another big deal. So again, it's aimed at bigger engines, longer range. So if you're looking for an airliner, a series hybrid system may or may not be interesting, depending on how you do the propulsion. You've really got to do distributed propulsion. You've got issues with moving megawatt scales of power around the airframe, which has got some challenges. You know, you need superconductors, etc. The near term, what we can do, I mentioned this previously, is we can put electrical. So for takeoff, you can put an extra half a megawatt into the engine boost it from a, a separate generator or a battery. That gives you a lot more power for takeoff. And then you can use the thermal engine in direct drive for cruise, where it's absolute maximum efficiency, probably grace the hybrid system even, depending on how it's integrated with the airframe. Now, it also has a big advantage that you can inject power into the engine on demand, or even transfer power between the different spools in the engine. That gives you much better controllability and also that gives you more freedom in the engine design. So there's a, a lot of things happening here that we're just uh, feeling our way with. We're doing some testing the next couple of years with, again, UK source machines on an, an engine to really develop that and understand it better. Okay, and what's on the horizon for electrical aircraft? So already we're looking at fairly low power systems for electrical taxiing, cargo drones, hybridized helicopter engine. So we're, we're doing a unit with Airbus where they've got twin engine aircraft with a big motor on one so we can restart in a few seconds. Saves fuel and cruise, but if you need the other engine, it's there almost immediately. And early work on eVTOL aircraft, um, short range battery and hybrid aircraft as well. As time goes by, we're gonna see bigger and bigger aircraft do there. So you know, 10 seat commuter, single aisle aircraft with electrically boosted turbofan, which is the CFM rise aircraft I've been talking about, are on the horizon for 2030 or so and beyond. At some point, we're gonna have a limit on how far we can go with pure hybrid, simply because you've got much better conversion efficiency if you just send the power down a mechanical shaft 
rather than convert it from mechanical power to electrical power, move it around back to mechanical power, depending on if you can get airframe efficiencies other ways, and also how much power we can get out of batteries. So it's really exciting, really interesting, and over the next 20 or 30 years, you know, it's not something that's here today, gone tomorrow. There's a very, very clear driver to do it for decades to come. So it's a going to be a really, really interesting process to, to live through. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks very much, Paul. So um, what we'll do now is we've just got a, another couple of minutes before our next uh, Insight talk. So um, just bear with us another couple of minutes. Uh, our next talk is going to be from uh, Martin Baker, who are going to give you a talk um, about uh, sort of engineering for life and give you a bit of an insight into their organization and how you can get involved. So um, just another couple of minutes and I'll hand over to Martin Baker, who will get started at 10 past 11. Thank you.
Take a picture, picture in picture, yeah. yeah. I was in the, the oh, okay. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Martin Baker's Careers in Aerospace talk for Royal, Aer Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, I'm Matt, I'm a graduate systems engineer at Martin Baker. And I'm Sally and I'm a design engineer. But first, a little bit about the history of Martin Baker. It was founded uh, by Sir James Martin as Martin's Aircraft Works in 1929. The company was then renamed and switched its focus from aircraft to ejection seats in 1942 in honour of Captain Valentine Baker, who was killed while testing the MB3 aircraft. Since the Mark I ejection seat, over 90,000 seats have been delivered, with over 16,500 currently in service. The first ejection was Joe Lancaster in 1949, and since then, over 7,600 lives have been saved by Martin Baker ejection seats. The company now has over 1,000 employees and provides ejection seats for 81 countries. This slide shows an overview of our company values, professionalism, understanding, teamwork, accountability, and integrity. We aim for our customers to have 100% confidence in us and lifetime loyalty, which we achieve by investing in the capabilities of our people, systems, and processes for continuous improvement and providing best value to our customers. Our ultimate vision is to be the global provider of choice for the world's most advanced ejection and crash worthy seats and associated safety systems. At the end of the day, we're in the business of saving lives and safety is at the heart of everything that we do. And this is why we do what we do. <laughs> Even with the best engineering in the world that goes into these aircraft, stuff can still go wrong. And we are the last line of defense between a failure and a fatality. In this video, you can see the pilot, Captain Brian Butes, was performing a high angle of attack, slow pass, in a CF-18 at a practice for an air show in Lethbridge Air Force Base. There was a loss of thrust on the right engine, which caused a dip in altitude. The pilot throttled, leading to a dive at a high bank angle. The pilot ejected in a Mark 14 NASA seat and walked away with no significant injuries. Canopy jettison, seat initiation and parachute deployment all happened in under 1.2 seconds. And you can find this uh, ejection and many more on YouTube. So an overview of, the, uh, of what products we actually make. So we don't just make the, uh, and, and design the ejection seats themselves. We design crew escape systems as a whole. So crew escape systems do include ejection seats. So actually getting the occupant out of the aircraft in a dangerous situation, uh, but also uh, things like escape path clearance. So there's always a, well, generally always a canopy above the actual ejection seat that we need to do something with before we uh, consider uh, ejecting out. So that could be a canopy jettison, uh, or, or canopy fracturing using a detonation cord to shaft the glass, for example. Uh, Interseat sequencing, so where we've got a, a twin seat aircraft, then we need to make sure that, uh, firstly, the, the two seats have no chance of colliding, so uh, sequencing them so that they don't uh, fire at the same time, uh, there's a de delay in between them to ensure that kind of separation. But then also where we've got a, a potential situation, maybe a, the, the front pilot or the rear pilot is incapacitated, can't eject themselves uh, if you're in, a, for example, a spin, uh, then interseat, the interseat sequencing system is what actually allows us uh, to have a pilot uh, eject both occupants uh, with a single one commanding the ejection. We also have uh, ground egress, so where you've got an emergency situation, not in the air, and you need to get out quickly, so you just need to jettison the canopy, um, and also ground support equipment to ensure that we can, uh, or our operators can service and maintain all the equipment that we produce. There's also crew systems, so uh, obviously humans sit in our seats, we need to make sure that we've got all the necessary systems to uh, ensure uh, that they uh, can still survive post-ejection, such as the seat survival kit. So if you're ejecting, say, over a desert where you're not going to be picked up for a, for a long time and you need food and water, uh, or if you eject over a jungle, you get stuck in the tree canopy, being able to escape from that tree canopy as well. 
uh, as well as torso harness as well, uh, keeping you in the seat itself. And then finally, we also have crashworthy seating. So not all aircraft are suited to installing an ejection seat. For example, a helicopter where you've got uh, spinning rotors above the head uh, that you would need to do something with first prior to ejection, uh, or where you've got, for example, a, a crew transport or a, or a large transport aircraft where it's not feasible to eject everyone on the aircraft. Uh, you would have crashworthy seating as well. So we're trying to minimize the actual injuries in and a crashing event uh, and minimizing fatalities as well. Quick overview of as well of what our actual ejection seat development histories looked like. So all the way from the original Mark I, when Sir James Martin uh, was asked by the Royal Air Force to standardize an ejection seat to, to ensure crew escape. Uh, originally, the idea being a lever arm to uh, swing the ejection seat out of an aircraft, but that proving too difficult to retrofit uh, and ending up with a, a, a gas-powered catapult to, uh, to, to launch the ejection seat out that we've used ever since. The, uh, the, the process being actually firing the seat using that gas power catapult, and then the occupant would be required to, to unstrap from the seat harness and strap into a parachute harness to actually be able to then go all, all the way through to that recovery phase. And that could take up to 30 seconds, so incredibly risky at lower altitudes. Uh, Mark II, then introducing uh, automatic parachute deployment to try and quicken that process. Mark IV, introducing a combined harness again to try and quicken that process of having to unstrap from the seat harness strap into a parachute harness. And then you can see as well, hopefully see that bubble between Mark VI and Mark VII of starting to introduce underseat rocket motors. So there became the need to eject from what we call a zero, zero condition, which is where you have zero altitude and zero airspeed. Um, so you need to be able to get enough height in the actual ejection phase to ensure that you can have a fully inflated canopy and a, and a, and a descent uh, with, no, uh, with no injuries or ground impact. So underseat rocket motor introduced to give the ejection seat the, the necessary acceleration to ensure you could have that uh, zero altitude ejection. Moving further on, we have Mark VIII introducing harness retraction to ensure the occupants in a, in, a, in a better position for ejection to minimize injuries. And Mark X introducing arm restraints, uh, keeping our, all, all arms and legs inside the ride at all times, folks. Um, NACES introducing electronic sequencing, so moving out of the purely mechanical sequencing world into the digital well, uh, world where we can uh, enhance our capabilities with our sequencer. And then Mark 16, introducing twin ejection guns. This is the Mark 16 seat right here, US 16E. And the US 16E specifically also having auto eject capability. So whereby in an F-35 hovering over a carrier deck, um, if your lift fan fails and you're gonna suddenly descend, the pilot needs to eject before they, need to, before they actually know they need to eject. So the auto eject capability being introduced to ensure that we can eject the pilot before they realize they need to eject as well. Neck protection devices also, in order to make sure the occupant's uh, head and neck is restrained during the ejection sequence to minimize injuries. And then finally, our latest development, Mark 18, introducing some active pitch controls, allowing us to rotate our rocket motor underneath uh, to improve injury metrics throughout the entire ejection phase. Final point, again, on our crashworthy seats. Um, so moving around, you can see, for example, we've got armored crew, whereby you're in an aircraft and you need to make sure that the crew is going to be protected if you come under fire um, and all the way around to our mission operator seat where we've got, for example, a large, uh, a large troop transport or a, or a surveillance aircraft, whereby, again, you need a seat that can uh, minimize the occupant's injury and ensure survivability on a crash landing and a hard landing, um, while also <clears throat> being something that the crew can sit in for, for hours and hours on end and carry out all their jobs. I'll talk now about some of the engineering challenges that uh, inform the development of our new seats. Um, so we design for coverage of a wide flight envelope with air speeds from 0 to 600 knots, a range of altitudes and aircraft angle, and of course the variability of occupants. Some examples of the wide range of aircraft envelope we designed for are the, um, on the slide behind me, you can see stills from the video we saw earlier with a low altitude, high bank ejection. And also an ejection from a Harrier GR9 Kandahar in 2009 at Martin Pert. Uh, the landing gear gave out. The pilot stayed in the aircraft until the last minute to steer it away from a formation of four other aircraft. The aircraft was fully armed and the pilot needed a last second, zero altitude, zero speed ejection. Unsurprisingly, humans are not optimally configured for high rates of acceleration, wind blast, or impact. Physiological limitations for the light occupant dictate the performance um, for the heavy occupant. 
from the occupant mass and size range affect the design of the seat, including the full ejected mass and the center of gravity and the cockpit design, including the lower limb clearance and reach for controls. Um, not only the size and weight, but also the center of gravity and physiological injury limits vary between cases. It's Newton's second law. The force is fixed as the amount of propellant in the seat can't change. A small occupant will be accelerated much faster than a large one. It's also an issue for cockpit fitment, and we do a number of cockpit trials to ensure anthropometric accommodation is optimal. Some of these issues are solved with parachute developments, which is a more complex system than you might think. We use a 28 foot diameter uh, aeroconical design, um, which works for a large suspended mass range at a lower descent velocity, um, to around 24 feet per second, which is equivalent to jumping from a nine foot platform with no parachute, and it's highly stable. The modern ejection seat is a complex autonomous air vehicle system designed to meet demanding requirements, not simply a catapult. The system complexity is driven by aircraft design, crew boarding range, and physiological limits, crew equipment, and increasingly stringent injury criteria. So this here is an example of one of our ejection, uh, ejection seat tests. Um, so we have a rocket sled test track at Langford Lodge in Ireland. Uh, where we, uh, Northern Ireland, I should say, where we do all our uh, zero to 600 knots, zero altitude ejection tests to ensure that all the systems that we design on the seat work as intended, work the way they should, and also ensure that all our injury metrics to make sure uh, during ejection our occupant is not going to be uh, injured during the actual ejection. We, we also make sure that they're all uh, met as well. So you can see there we have the, uh, a mock up of the fuselage of the F 35 behind uh, in front of a rocket pusher sled so a lot of rockets got to get us up to that 450 knots for the test system initiation uh, and then we get our ejection seat going up the catapults all the various systems triggering the the drogue parachute deploying to slow us down and then the actual full parachute deploying for the recovery so as i mentioned just there all the various systems initiating and going off that's an example but they're, they're all the events that actually happen during the ejection sequence so probably a lot more than than anyone would expect all the way from the very start there you can see the seat pan firing handle being pulled where the occupant pulls that black and yellow handle to initiate the ejection sequence all the way through to a full recovery under the parachute canopy uh, to touch down and for example in water where the harness uh, automatically releases uh, and, and with the and with a life raft deploying too some key things to take away from that. So you can see the the note the events in red there from the under seat rocket motor initiating. So that's the, the rocket under the seat to give you that zero zero capability. All the way through to the inflated parachute pulling the occupant from the seat. All that in red there happens in about half a second and is captured within the picture you see there. So again, an incredibly quick process. We're talking about seconds here to ensure that across our full envelope of flight, be it at zero speed, zero altitude, or all the way up at X thousand feet, we can uh, we can have a safe recovery of the occupant at all times. It's the skilled people that make our product possible and ensure we deliver a product that works first time and every time. Martin Baker is always looking for new talent to join our business. We have many early career opportunities for those with an interest in the product and enthusiasm to learn. We offer. A range of opportunities, starting with apprenticeships, where we offer a four-year structured programme featuring a large range of possible personal and professional development opportunities, such as HND, HNC, and sponsored degrees. There are team-building events throughout the year, and several apprentices have gone on to make their careers at Martin Baker, working in departments from human engineering to mechanical design. We also offer summer placements and year-in-industry 12-month placements within a department. Applications are open now and close on the 7th of January. It's a paid position and you'll be working on actual projects and potentially interacting with customers. As mentioned, we now have over a thousand employees and Martin Baker have added over 200 engineering staff in the last five years. We're a rapidly growing business with an ever growing customer base. We have current vacancies in mechanical engineering, environmental test, product safety, production engineering, program management, software and electronic engineering, stress engineering, and systems engineering. A full list of opportunities can be found on our website. And if you're interested, 
Even if you don't feel you're an exact match for any of these positions, please come and talk to us in our virtual booth. As for me, I graduated in engineering from Cambridge University in 2009. I initially uh, joined a graduate training scheme at Thames Water, working in clean water treatment, but I left after a year as I wanted a role with more technical engineering focus. I then worked at a company called Russell Finex Lids and Filters from 2011 to 2017, designing industrial sieving equipment for the food, pharmaceutical and process industries. I achieved chartership with the Institute of Mechanical Engineers while I was there. I joined Martin Baker in 2017 as a design engineer, as I was looking for a wider range of technical challenges. I was drawn to the engineering in the seats, um, the aerospace aspect of it, uh, and the opportunity to work with and learn from a large team of experienced engineers, as well as the strong focus on saving lives. Um, in my role here, I initially worked on ground support equipment, and then I moved to the uh, development of the Mark 18 seat for the KF21. And I'm currently working on a new seat to retrofit into the F16. So my journey, so uh, I, I've always loved planes and simulators from a young age, right from the tender age of six, when my stepbrother handed me his copy of Flight Simulator 2002 that bored him to death. I found it incredible and I was enamored ever since. So that led me on to doing aerospace engineering at the University of Liverpool. I joined in 2014 on the master's program, the MEng, and I was straight in there with the university's flight simulation group and the university's aerospace society, um, trying to cement my passion and really immerse myself in the field that I loved. Uh, in 2018, while I was on the master's program, I was actually offered a PhD in on system training and simulation. Uh, and I, I knew I wanted to explore the world of academia. I loved the, the idea of the topic and I thought, why not? So I decided to transfer on to the, back onto the bachelor's and take up the PhD straight away while the offer lasted. Um, and after two years, a particularly difficult second year, unfortunately due to the pandemic and all the research uh, difficulties that came with that, I decided that wasn't the right career path for me and that I wanted to look towards industry. So having sat in the replica Martin Baker ejection seat in our university's flight, uh, flight simulator for the past three years, thought I know where I'm gonna apply and apply to Martin Baker. And to my amazement and joy, I was offered a place in the systems engineering department and since joining just about seven months ago now, I've been working on test predictions, test analyses, uh, requirements management. Uh, I've, I'm mentoring a year in industry student. Um, I, I've worked on a huge array of projects uh, and a huge array of tasks all within a really short space of time. So an incredible experience, given the fact that I've only been here for seven months with all the support that goes with that. The way that people access the Martin Baker brand is changing. Each of these six digital channels is a funnel to the market, Martin Baker brand. We're reaching nearly 40,000 followers across five social media platforms on a regular basis. We had over 9.5 million impressions on people across all six channels over the past 12 months. Um, each of these serves a very different purpose and services different needs. So please do take a look um, at any of these. Uh, YouTube especially has some very interesting company videos of rejections and um, our most popular is uh, a black and white video, historical video of the company. We're very fortunate to have a very photogenic product. <laughs> so a question that we do get quite often is what is the future of aviation, manned aviation particularly? Uh, and this is an example of what it could look like. So these are, these are, are, are projects that are currently in progress that we would love to be a part of. For example, the UK's next generation fighter, the Tempest, America's uh, NGAD and Europe's uh, FCAS. Um, the KF-21 we are actually a part of right now. So that was announced uh, back in April of this year that we were, we were a partner with uh, on the KF-21. Um, and that's the team that I'm in right now. So working on an incredibly exciting project that's happening right now, uh, going through its safety of flight trials next year. So um, there's a lot of lot of scope for future opportunities with all the next generation aircraft that are currently in development. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we hope uh, we've given you a bit of an insight into the world of ejection seats and, uh, and escape systems and uh, hopefully uh, enthused some of your interests. Please come and meet us in the virtual booth. Uh, we're, we're open to questions. and uh, We'd love to uh, walk you through either our career opportunities or just ejection seats in general if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you.
very much, Martin Baker. So um, I'm just going to hand straight over now to our next speaker uh, from Cranfield University. So over to you, Perry. Okay, thank you. First of all, can you hear me all right? Can Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I will my screen then. Can you now see a slide that says hydrogen for green aviation? No, it's not popped up at the moment. Okay, let me try again. For some reason, the share button doesn't seem to work. It's, it's not working at all. Yes, although I get to the position. Mm. Uh, you have my presentation. Would you like to share it? Yeah, just bear with me a second. And I will last change slide, please. When Sure, yeah. Yeah. It's always good to have a backup. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that the one, Perry? That is the one, yes. Okay, yes. no worries. I'll I'll leave you to it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to the Royal Aeronautical Society for this invitation. Uh, I would like also to raise an invitation to those of you that want to join the aircraft revolution that is taking place right now. Uh, it is one of the topics of conversation as we speak in COP26. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit of who we are, the strategy that uh, you know we are foreseeing to move forward, then some aspects, also how this revolution is going to influence not just aviation, but many other areas, and how we feel the key obstacle is to make the decision to invest in uh, these technologies. Uh, I will uh, highlight that much of what I say has uh, appeared recently in the Aeronautical Journal in the September issue, that is uh, the special issue for ISABE. I will also be highlighting where our postgraduates are making a contribution. And uh, it is my feeling that uh, for the future, you know, many of you in the audience will be able to be making a contribution. Next slide, please. Who we are, Cranfield was set up in 1946 by the British government really to advance science and engineering and aviation. Uh, I am from uh, propulsion and one of the four original units was aircraft propulsion, very heavily devoted to the gas turbine engine. 1969, Cranfield became a university. The name that it gave itself was Cranfield Institute of Technology, 1993. Because of expansion, Cranfield change its name to Cranfield University because it reflected many the many activities that were there in a better way. We've been doing a lot, a lot of work on hydrogen. We see hydrogen as one of the key solutions to the environmental footprint of uh, civil aviation. And uh, we have been working on more, for more than 25 years in this area with external clients, but also we have committed many of our own projects. If we go to the next slide. So decarbonizing aviation, decarbonation, decarbonizing aviation is a very important challenge, very necessary, but also we need to be careful that we do it in such a way that uh, we don't go back in terms of economic and 
social benefits that aviation and other industries bring. As you know, there has been a lot of progress in the eradication of poverty. There's still a very long way to go, and I'm talking globally now. And whatever we do, we must make sure we don't go back in this very important endeavor. So we do feel that hydrogen offers a solution to continue reaping the socioeconomic benefits of aviation, while at the same time protecting the environment. Why hydrogen? Hydrogen does not emit any carbon dioxide as long as it is produced without the emissions of carbon. Also, it doesn't produce any of the other carbon byproducts that uh, come out from a hydrocarbon fuel. Um, and also, the fuel does not sulfur, so there will be no sulfur oxides. Furthermore, hydrogen gives opportunities to reduce NOx much more than any other hydrocarbon fuel. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. And another non-carbon issue to be considered is Cyrus. Cyrus avoidance, you know what we talk about as contrails, contrails formed by Cyrus formed by contrails. And, uh, you know, there is a way of avoiding this regardless of the fuel we are using. Next slide, please. So the solution we see for decarbonizing aviation has uh, two uh, elements. One is for the shorter range aircraft, and this accounts for about um, 60 to 70 percent of aircraft movements electric, hybrid electric, and fuel cell propulsion. And uh, for the longer ranges, where about 70% of aviation carbon dioxide is emitted, we see hydrogen deployed in um, quasi-conventional aircraft engines. And we see these two elements working together in a hub-and-spoke arrangement, where hubs are connected by longer range hydrogen flights and the spokes the shorter local flights are being carried out using electric hybrid electric and fuel cell propulsion you know this mode of operating aircraft used to be quite popular a few years ago next slide please <clears throat> and here we see these uh, two families being deployed in innovation waves if we want to start decarbonizing quickly, then we need to accept that the product that we put in place is perhaps not going to be the best technologically. Of course, it has to be very, very safe to continue to capitalize on the experience on health and safety that aviation has brought about over decades. So we see a first innovation wave where the primary focus is to put quickly aircraft in service and the focus here is going to be the certification of the aircraft, because it's not only the aircraft that needs to be developed, also the certification rules will need to be developed in parallel with the development of the aircraft. For the second innovation wave, we see an emphasis on improving the efficiency of uh, the different concepts. And for the third innovation wave, we see bringing together the hydrogen combustion with uh, the electrical technology. Hydrogen will need to be stored in uh, liquid form in the aircraft. Uh, this is at a temperature of uh, minus 250 degrees centigrade. And this presents excellent opportunities for cryogenics and for superconductivity. It is this kind of vehicle that we see can be more efficient than um, conventional fuel vehicles that we have today because hydrogen would permit op the opportunity to, to do things that at the moment we cannot do with conventional fuels. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, if we could go back one. Sorry, back again. 
back again. Yes. Yes, that one. Thank you. So one of the very large projects we have at the moment is through a partnership with uh, the European Union. And, uh, you know, there is a, about 20 participants in this program called Enable H2. And here the primary objective is uh, to establish how we can burn the hydrogen in uh, the aircraft engine, producing a much lower level of NOx than is currently being produced with conventional engines. As, as you know, NOx, nitrogen oxide, is one of the um, pollutants that is causing serious concern for a number of reasons. And in the picture at the top right, you can see a hydrogen flame. And one of the features of the hydrogen flame is that uh, it's quite dark. You know, it's not a very luminous flame. And uh, this is an added benefit in uh, terms of the engine operability. The combustors of such an engine are going to be very, very different to the conventional combustors that we have today. And uh, at the bottom uh, right, you see uh, a little bit, you know, a cartoon of what one of those combustors would look like. But this is the design basis of these components. The other benefit of hydrogen is that uh, because of its very low temperature and this high specific heat, it can be a very useful heat sink to be able to exploit in a number of different ways. <clears throat> What I want to talk uh, next in the next slide is uh, about the partnership. Uh, and again, here we have many of our doctoral and master's projects uh, taking place. I won't go through the logos, but you can see many of them that are uh, very, very familiar to you. Next slide. Okay, this is the TERA. TERA stands for Techno-Economic Environmental Risk Analysis. And uh, in Cranfield, we use it very much as a crystal ball. These are mathematical models, uh, quite frequently validated with uh, real results, where we try to predict uh, the future in a technical term, an economic term, and uh, an environmental uh, term. And what this shows here is one of the examples, of one of our Terra studies, where we try to examine how you could uh, eliminate contrails. Um, contrails are formed when an aircraft flies through atmospheric conditions that, you know, to cut a long story short, are conducive to the formation of what we call the long contrails, the persistent contrails, and these are the ones that may long term evolve into cirrus clouds. And uh, <clears throat> then we produce a mathematical model of the airplane, we produce a mathematical model of the engine, we chose one particular route. This route was from London to Athens, a distance of about 1,600 nautical miles. Uh, we used an optimizer, a mathematical And to our model, we introduced for the Met Office. And uh, what you see in the is uh, this is a plot of uh, altitude against distance. This is the distance of the flight. And the gray blue area you can see at the top is where given the atmospheric day. conditions of that particular day form. Then you see a number of flight paths that uh, we explored. And uh, the red flight path is the conventional flight path that would normally take place. The flight path in blue that uh, we consider the best. So the red flight path, the normal one, produce about 1,300 1, knots. Contrails. 
the flight path in blue produced zero contrails. There, everybody. Sorry about that. We we had a slight technical glitch there, so okay. <laughs> like we, we've got Perry back. So um, let me just reshare my screen. I say carry on from where you left off, Perry. Okay. <laughs> where where did you last see me? <laughs> it was slight date. Yeah, yeah. It was. There we go. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay, let me start this slide again to make sure that we hit at the right point. Um, here you have a TERA, Techno-Economic Environmental Risk Analysis Study, on contrail avoidance. And the contrails are formed when the aircraft flies through a particular set of atmospheric conditions that are conducive to the formation of contrails. And what this exercise was all about is um, to introduce in our model the region in the atmosphere where the contrails were um, formed. And you can see this in the picture at the right as the gray-blue area that is uh, on the diagram. So we use uh, an aircraft model a Cranfield aircraft model based on a real aircraft. We complemented this with the appropriate engine model that is used in this aircraft, and we used a particular optimizing technique. This work was done for a very big European project called Clean Sky. And what you see here is uh, the possible routes that we examined, the red route being the standard one, and uh, this flight was London to Athens, 1,600 nautical miles, and the standard flight would have produced 
more than 1,300 nautical miles of contrails. We tried several routes and eventually we got to the blue one. In the blue one, there were no contrails formed because essentially we were avoiding the contrail forming region of the atmosphere and um, this gave zero contrails. The aircraft had to fly a little bit lower, it had to burn a little bit more fuel, but uh, you know, when we computed the additional fuel burn, it was approximately 1%, which was, of course, very small. So this is the kind of study that, you know, masters and doctoral researchers have been engaging, you know, when we were working in this particular major European project. Next slide, please. Now, uh, what we expect is going to be a very large production of hydrogen if we're going to satisfy the needs, not just of aviation, but, you know, elements of automotive as well, and some uh, commercial and residential and industrial elements. And we foresee that uh, ships to take liquid hydrogen across the sea. And uh, here you have one uh, such example you know, this is um, a hydrogen tanker using hydrogen propulsion and uh, also renewables. And this is the subject of one of our doctoral researchers. Next slide, please. And uh, this is where we maintain hydrogen will require for us to look at many human activities in a much more integrated way. You know, just to give an example, the, in 2014, the UK had about 85 gigawatts of uh, electricity generation capacity installed. And this capacity produced a little bit more than 300,000 gigawatt hours of electricity. If we start looking at the hydrogen requirements of aviation and uh, automotive, you know, once you do some uh, simple calculations, you found out that we will have to approximately double the electricity production of the UK. And because a lot of this additional electricity capacity will need to be with renewables. And as you know, renewables are intermittent. We foresee that um, as a country, we may need to triple the electricity generating capacity in place. Then, uh, of course, you know, the power generation organizations will need to be involved in uh, these investments, in these decisions. Automotive will be also, in addition to aerospace, a very important consumer. And we must not forget water. Again, our calculations tell us that to be able to do this, we will need 10,000 tons of liquid hydrogen every day. And this means that the chemical feedstock for this is 100,000 tons of water. And uh, in a addition, we need to consider cooling requirements. As you know, seawater in many countries in the world is a precious resource. And then uh, we should be thinking of electrolyzing seawater, not to put a new pressure on fresh water. So you see, you know, if we were to be think of implementing hydrogen in aerospace, there are many, many, many other things that we would need to consider as well. Next one. So in a way, this is your homework. Um, this transition is not going to be cheap, but we certainly believe it is worth it. It is going to provide wonderful opportunities, you know, to many of the people, the younger people in, uh, in this virtual room, I hope. And um, <clears throat> then it is important to consider, to continue to reap the socioeconomic benefits of aviation in this context, while at the same time protecting the environment. This is going to require some revolutionary changes, 
And this success is dependent on a steady stream of talent participating in this industry. I have been at Cranfield for, uh, you know, three decades now, approximately, and I have never seen it as exciting as uh, it is today. So if we go to the next slide. So I would like to extend you this uh, invitation and uh, I know we are past our time, so if there is an interest, we can offer to plan a longer question and answer session, you know, with the auspices of uh, the Royal Aeronautical Society. So with this, I'm going to say thank you for your attention. Very much for that perry so apologies everybody for the slight delay there i think we just had some slight tech issues so used to that now so i will just hand over to our next speakers so without further ado it's going to be uh, bombardier so i will let them introduce themselves so i'll just pop them all up now thanks everyone. good morning everyone uh, so i'm just going to share my screen uh, do let me know. Um, I know we've got Jack on the line. Jack, can you just let me know we can see it? Perfect. Okay. So welcome, everybody. Um, we are starting our first talk off today uh, to go through uh, the early careers within aviation. Um, we're hoping to give you an insight into um, what Bombardier's vision is for the future. Um, and we have some of our apprentices and interns on the line who are going to talk through their experiences, their top tips, and uh, their experience at Bombardier. I'm also joined by General Manager Paul, um, who is going to start by um, sharing our vision for the future and what Bombardier have to, yeah, have to offer and where we see the future of apprentices uh, and graduates, uh, how they're going to help our business. So yeah, without further ado. Yep, so uh, thanks for the invite today. It's uh, really exciting to be here. It's such an important, important event. Just to let everybody no, around nearly 25 years ago, I was an aerospace apprentice back in Belfast. So it's definitely the way to get into the to the industry and the career will be as good as you want to make it. This is an extremely uh, important development piece for Bombardi. You know, and our 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 vision is to grow our own talent with it within the business. So we want to invest in the in the young people in in highly paid, highly skilled jobs. And really develop them for for the future. You know, we want to ensure that everybody that comes out of an apprenticeship scheme is uh, competent uh, and has the abilities and skills to, to grow where this industry where this industry can can take you. It's a key priority for us, especially here in London Biggin Hill. We are building a massive new what we're calling a mega center MRO, uh, which will be opening next year. So we need lots and lots of uh, young talented uh, engineers to come and fill the place across all roles not just fixing aircraft but in planning in quality in logistics in procurement etc we, we we need the full uh, skill base we're also working with uh london big and hill on creating the aerospace ecosystem you know around around our facility but making sure that we can support you know all the other uh, facilities in the area with with, with developing the, those skills and and getting the people interested in, in the business. Yeah, so like our vision is set from the top. So this isn't just a London Big and Hill uh, initiative. This is from you know uh, J C Gallagher, who's our executive vice president of services. Uh, you know this is apprenticeship is a way that we can get people. In People in the company and keep them in the company. You know, we want to be uh, the, the best MRO in the world. We want uh, to advance the, te the technologies in the world, and we want to really, really develop people. And we want people to uh, to stay in the business. I've been in Bombardi twenty five years. My father was there for thirty eight years. Uh, so you know, it is a, a family business, and I think once you're once you're in it, you know, you will love it. And we're on a very, very exciting journey now. Uh, 
to what we want to build here in the future. So yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Um, with that being said, we're very, very pleased to announce that we will be launching our 2022 uh, Level 3 Apprenticeship with Marshall Aerospace um, and Marshall's Training Center. So um, this is going to be offering a aircraft maintenance apprenticeship um, supported by Marshalls who will prov uh, provide the training um, throughout four years. Um, this involves um, workshop, hand skills, um, on-the-job training, um, just building up loads of key critical skills to be able to complete the course um, within four years with a level three aircraft maintenance apprenticeship. Um, so there's loads of things that Marshall offers. Um, and with Bombardia and Marshalls working together, one of the main things that we are extremely, um, you know, one of the big things that we find that's most important is apprenticeship well-being. Um, so it's not just about providing the on-the-job training and the technical elements, but it's providing those life skills as well. So providing training on how to support your finances if it's your first time moving away from home, um, you know, supporting your well-being throughout the apprenticeship because it is a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of new people. It might be your first role, um, your first job. So it's having that kind of support system um, throughout Marshalls, throughout Bombardier, um, through mental schemes um, and peer systems as well. So um, we're really pleased. We're very excited. The apprenticeship um, advert will be launching this month and people will be able to apply if you're interested in the scheme um, over the course of the next um, four or five months. So please keep an eye out on our LinkedIn um, and through the Bombardier website as well for those job adverts. I'm now going to hand over to uh, some of our apprentices just to talk you through um, just about the early years and how you get into how you get into the apprenticeship and what to expect and what are some of their key tips. So first up, I'm going to hand over to Tom. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a level four uh, B licensed certifying apprentice currently at Bombardier. And um, I started my career uh, straight from GCSEs. I came out of school and went into an apprenticeship with Virgin Atlantic, a level three apprenticeship. And um, where we passed all our A license modules. And then earlier this year in 2021, I joined Bombardier for their level four certifying B license apprenticeship. Uh, yeah. And I'm just gonna talk about getting into the industry really, and some of the best ways to start off in the industry and how to join. So I would first recommend uh, researching the industry really well. So just looking online, talking to people about the different routes you can take from ace maintenance to light maintenance to line maintenance whether you want to do really deep component maintenance or on aircraft maintenance so it's really good to get a good understanding of what kind of maintenance you want to get into before you um start applying and then i would also say to um if you haven't already it's probably a good idea to get a linkedin profile and start looking on there because that's where i saw the advert for Virgin and Bombardier it was all on LinkedIn and it's really great where employers can um, put up their adverts for the jobs and anything they're advertising so you can get on there straight away and sign up for the apprenticeship or just find out more information you can connect with people and just talk to them about what they do and whether there's any opportunities for you to come in and do work experience or anything like that I'd recommend that and also just getting any experience where you can, whether that's any practical experience you can get at college or trying to get work experience within an aircraft maintenance environment, because any experience is great to mention at an interview or when you, whenever you're going forward for any career in aviation, it's great to be enthusiastic about it and try and have some experience to show people that you really want to get into the industry. So, yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tom. And now over to um, Jack. Jack, are you there? Are you on mute? keep your mic muted no one can hear you so um lesson learned hi everyone uh, my name is jack hawkins uh much like tom i'm a level four b1 b2 apprentice at bombardier 
Um, so obviously Tom's given a bit of an insight into to his journey as an apprentice. Uh, so I thought I'd just have a bit of a chat about the the overall bigger picture. Um, so th firstly, I thought it'd be good to start off by speaking about the routes and roles available. Um, you know, uh, so, so as Tom mentioned, he started off in a level three apprenticeship. And um, that's certainly where a lot of people start off. Um, so subsequently from getting a level three, you can become a mechanic, uh, go on to get your licenses on a level four apprenticeship, much like us. Um, and, you know, there are absolute realms of possibilities and uh, opportunities out there, especially at Bombardier. Um, obviously, there are different routes that you could take to, to become an engineer and work in the industry. So obviously, we've chosen the apprentice route. Um, and that's what best for us. Personally, I'm, I'm biased and I would say that get, taking an apprenticeship is really the best route you can you can take as an engineer. But so there are a lot of graduates out there. And what I would say is don't discount the apprentice route. I know at school there's a bit of a stigma. Um, I think it's a fantastic route to take. Uh, and it really does give you the skill sets and the qualifications you need to, to be a good engineer. Um, at Bombardier, we, we split our time between uh, gaining our formal qualifications and uh, in the hangar working on the aircraft getting experience. Um, so, you know, there is quite, quite a split between the two. Uh, we do really quite get quite involved with everyone and all the work that, that goes on in the hangar, which is really good for our experience and our development. Um, much like Tom, I just echo that, you know, there are things that you could be doing to prepare yourself for a career in aviation. Um, it's a really big industry and there's lots that you can learn about and, and go into. It's not just maintenance. So I would say, again, as Tom said, like look at LinkedIn, um, look at bigger opportunities before you enter the working world. So like vol voluntary opportunities, maybe some work experience with Bombardier, if, that, if that's something that you know, you, you'd like to contact them about um, or, you know, vice versa. And just things that you can get yourself prepared for get yourself an insight and really knuckle down and, and understand what it is that you're, you, you want, you want to be doing for the rest of your life. Um, Bombardier itself, there's, there's an absolute abundance of opportunity to grow in the company as well. And that's something that I really like about it there. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've, you know, I've really enjoyed my time today and I'm looking forward to getting my licenses and the qualifications out of the way. And just, you know, every day you learn more and more. And uh, there are guys that started off as mechanics and I like project management, um, you know, and th there's just so much growth and there's so so much that you can learn. Montreal, obviously, is where the manufacturing is done. So like flight testing, dynamics, design. Obviously, there are a lot of graduates that are currently watching this. So if that's something that you want to go into eventually, that's certainly something that you could, I'd imagine, go down um, with the company. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm sure if anyone has any questions, I'll be, I'll be around to answer them. Yeah, cheers. Cool. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm now going to just hand over to Anib. So just to explore a different avenue, um, Anib joined us as a, an intern um, and he um, was a graduate from aviation management. I won't overlook it. I won't say too much about his story, but um, Bombardier are very well known and have a host of internships available. Um, it's a really good way to get into the industry, explore different roles um, and just find out, you know, gain the experience. Um, and we're looking for, you know, some really key skills. So, you know, just being curious, being motivated, um, you know, being able to, to deal with challenges. Aviation comes with a lot of challenges. So, um, you know, an eye for detail, and, and being a team player and working together because there's nothing more important, you know, than delivering an aircraft and uh, working on an aircraft safely in a in a manner that's, uh, yeah, delivering teamwork. So I'm going to hand over to Anib now just to talk a little bit about his journey from a different angle. Uh, hi, guys. I think you saw me laughing when my slide came up. I didn't know Anna was going to put up my uh, mugshot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... It's, it's, it's woken me up a bit, but um, I guess I'm going to, I actually got the best of both worlds. So I did an apprenticeship before I moved into aviation and uh, started with a degree. So I did my apprenticeship um, with the civil service. So it was, it was in a totally different industry. It was uh, within public policy, within the civil service, um, working in government and the, the first tip I want to give you is to make sure when you're entering the workforce, you're not just applying for a job, but make sure that the job you're applying for is something you're passionate about. Because if you're just applying for a job, uh, the, the, you won't put in uh, the value that your employer would expect you to put in. If you're applying for a job that you're passionate about, you're not just going to be doing what the employer expects of you, but you're also going to be doing a whole load more than that. The employer is going to be thinking, wow, 
this person's incredible and then multiple opportunities and avenues would open from there so, th so that's just my first point um my my second point is um i i graduated in aviation management i see that quite a few people in the q a and a um I graduated in uh, bn aerospace management uh, sorry aerospace engineering and such aeronautical engineering which is amazing so i'm guessing you want to go into the engineering group i'm just gonna I, I i just i just wanted to let you know that not everyone always goes particularly into engineering sometimes they go into management routes within the engineering industry within aerospace because if you think of bombardier in the big picture sense yes it's true we have mechanics and technicians but in 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 that ecosystem we also need management we also need business improvement so in my internship uh, at bombardier i started in the stores department helping stores uh we got unserviceable components in we had to book them in put the details in and such and then from there um i t i moved into uh, a business a process improvement uh position so bombardier begin here was expanding at the moment and because we're expanding we want to make sure that not every organization is perfect no one's perfect bombardier is striving for perfection that's why they're a global leader but to ensure that we stay on top of everything we always want to improve upon ourselves how what can we do better so that's where i come in finding where in the business we can improve certain processes um and and such and make sure that we're we're not just adding value but we're gaining more value out of things that we're doing at the moment so if if i was to give you top tips um just just make sure when you're applying for something uh you you're you're following your passion Make sure that when you're doing an application, uh, you're looking at quality in contrast to quantity. You can apply for hundreds, hundreds of jobs, hundreds of grad schemes, and you'll get zero percent success rate. Or maybe you'll get through uh, to a stage and then you'll flop. But the only reason why is because maybe you didn't put enough effort into the application because you're spreading yourself thin. So make sure that you pick something that you're truly passionate about because it will become much more easier to get through the recruitment process. Now, if I was to tell you how I got into Bombardier, and this is this is the top tip that I could give anyone, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is basically the powerhouse of recruitment because when you're applying for jobs, you're applying yourself on Indeed and uh, Bombardier's website and such. Um, but on LinkedIn, recruiters also approach you because your app, you, your application, your profile is already there. And I can see in quite a few people are sharing their LinkedIn, which is amazing. So make sure that you work hard on your LinkedIn and please feel free to visit my LinkedIn uh, uh, profile or visit LinkedIn profiles of people who graduated the year before you who have graduate positions to see what their profile looks like. See how you can improve upon your profile because once you improve upon your own brand image within LinkedIn and on your CV and such, then recruiters will feel more attracted to come forward and ask you to apply for a certain position because 20% of the job market is advertised, whereas the majority, 80% of the job market is actually not advertised uh, anywhere. It's done either through recruitment agencies, who don't advertise as much, but instead they headhunt you. So that's a big tip that I can give about LinkedIn. Um, key tips I would give. Don't fret, opportunities are returning as the pandemic subsides. Uh, British Airways have uh, introduced a graduate scheme. Bombardier are going through an apprenticeship drive, but also there's going to be an intern internship drive as well. So make sure uh, that you look out for these opportunities as well. Uh, don't forget about experience. There's many internships and mentorships programs available at Bombardier. Bombardier aren't just here to employ people to make sure that we're just increasing productivity. We're, we're here to emp empower you and grow you as well. So we're not just um, looking at uh, giving you a position, we're looking at uh, fostering new skills, uh, new attributes that you have, um, work, uh, really utilizing the strengths that you have, but also turning weaknesses that you have into strengths. Because I think we can all agree that with students, we're just we, or we've just graduated, we don't have that much experience in the workplace. So don't expect the employer to expect you to hit the ground running. What they expect you to show such is that you have the core soft skills that uh, the employer can morph and shape. 
So then once you hit the ground running, you have those soft skills. And then they can be refined into hard skills with technical skills. Or with specific software and such, or even soft skills when it comes to teamwork and communication. If there's one tip I could give when it comes to interviews. Sometimes the interviewer ask you, oh, uh, X, Y, Z, but you don't have any scenario in your head. It's good to think about things that you've done in university, create these scenarios in your head. Where have I used teamwork exceptionally well, commun communication, prioritization, working under pressure? So when you create these scenarios in your head and don't just make them up. I, I'm sure that um, mo most of us graduates are 21 or with, basically we've, we've lived quite a long time <laughs> since birth. <laughs> we've got a lot of experience in life. We're not just talking about experience within the workplace. We're talking about life skills because teamwork, prioritization, communication, these are all life skills that we've learned. And we've all, 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 all make, we've all gone through scenarios where we've used these skills. So just make sure that you just show them off. Because when we're not expecting you to be a Superman or something like that, or Superwoman, we're just expecting you, you to reflect that. Uh, Oh, sorry, I'm so I think sorry. I'm, no, <laughs> I'm just going. I'm quite just running over. So thank you so much. You were fantastic. Um, I'm just going to have to move as long as I know it's minutes. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure there was so much useful information. Aniba is fantastic. Um, a really fantastic resource. If you want to reach out to him on on LinkedIn. So like you said, please do. He, I'm sure he'll be happy to help. Um. And then just finally from us, um, we've mentioned that we've got, we're launching our apprenticeship scheme. So if you are interested, please keep an eye out. Um, official advert is going to be coming soon. Um, and as, in terms of internships as well, um, we're always looking for, um, you know, new talent, um, new kind of areas where um, you can add value, like Anib said. So visit Bombardia, reach out to myself. Um, my email address is there. Me and the um the web uh the live chat now so please feel free to pop over with any questions that you may have reach us on linkedin connect with Bombardier on linkedin connect with our apprentices um and do ask any questions that you may have thank you very much for joining us um and we hope to speak to you soon thank you Thanks, guys. Thanks, Anna. So please, please do go and chat to them in their virtual room. Cheers, guys. So the next talk is going to take place at 12.30, everybody. So and that is going to be from our next speaker, which is the UK Space Agency. So we're just going to have a short 10-minute uh, break now until 12.30. So if you can all rejoin us at 12.30 for the next talk, which is from the UK Space Agency, and that's going to be all about careers in space, not just for astronauts. So thanks very much.
Okay, everybody, thanks very much. Um, hope you've just managed to have a quick comfort break and um, gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker from the UK mm -hmm. Space Agency. So I'll, I'll let Jeremy introduce himself. So I'll um, just hand over to Jeremy now. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks very much, Nick. Um, so I'm Jeremy Curtis. I'm Head of Education and Skills at the UK Space Agency. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about careers in the space sector. Um, right, I'm just not sure yet whether I'm sharing the slides in the right way. Oh, here we go. Right. Uh, so I'm going to change the mode so you can see it better. OK, so what I'm going to talk about then is how careers in space is not just for astronauts, it's for everybody. Um, so with any up, you'll find there's some examples here of things that you can get involved in. Um, so there's a whole lot of reasons why space matters to the UK. Uh, it produces a huge economic impact. It helps us understand the universe. There's all sorts of applications that help people on the ground and protect our planet. So there's a lot going on in Glasgow at the moment. That's really clearly very important. And then inspiring society through things like exploration and, of course, careers for people like you. So let's get stuck in. So the first thing that you may think of with space at the moment in the UK is launches. We're licensing a lot of launch sites across the UK. So there's opportunities there for new companies to start building um, spacecraft um, that will operate in low Earth orbit, launches to get them there and space ports um, to handle the whole operation. So a lot of new companies there. So that's clearly going to provide new opportunities for people to work in space. Probably the biggest um, area that makes uh, an impact on our economy, though, is communication satellites. These are called Hotbird satellites. They're built in the UK for UTELSAT um, by Airbus, which is one of the biggest space companies in Europe. So communication satellites, a quarter of the world's communication satellites are built in the UK and they um, affect everything we do um, and it dominates the money that is ch generated in the UK. So talking a little bit about that, just to show how big the sector is, to get you a feel for it, about £16 billion pounds of turnover in the average year at the moment um, and it's growing fast. We've already got about 5% of the world um, economy in space, so it's a pretty big deal. And about 1,200 organisations work in space in the UK. So for you, the important thing is there's 45,000 people already working in space, but we're looking to increase that a lot, probably another 30,000 or so people by 2030. So that's a big increase. You can see it's growing fast. And uh, in terms of what level of uh, qualification you need, about three quarters of the people working in the sector have a first degree um, and I think it's roughly half have a second degree. So it's well worthwhile considering that. Um, you may not have to have a brain the size of a planet to work in space, but having qualifications does really help. And, you know, we're not doing too badly compared with most high tech industries. One in three women, um, uh, one in three people are women in the space sector. We want to do better. So we're welcoming everybody from every background um, and we need more people. And that's one way we can do it by attracting more people from underserved um, groups, let's say. So let's start talking a little bit about um, understanding our universe and why we do this sort of thing. So. Understanding the universe, um, you'll probably think of astronomy as the first area of um, understanding that we're talking about here. This is a typical Hubble picture, but we're about to replace Hubble with a bigger light that's going to look, instead of in uh, visible light, it's going to look in infrared. So heat, if you like, it'll probe to the centers of galaxies and to the distant parts of the, the universe, and it'll even help us spot um, exoplanets around other stars. So this is the biggest, um, satellite, uh, the biggest telescope that will ever have been launched into space. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope, or Webb Telescope for short. Its mirror is six and a half metres across, so that's vast. So if you're a mechanical engineer like me, the thought of having to fold up the whole of that construction into a rocket fairing to be launched is mind-boggling, but they've achieved it, and this is going to be launched on the 18th of December this year. Um, and look at the solar um, protection there to keep the whole thing cool, because if we're measuring heat, we need to keep it cool. And it's got panels to reflect the heat away. They're the size of a tennis court. This thing is vast. And it's now reached uh, South America for the launch. This is the ship that arrived a few days ago in Peru, in French Guyana. 
um, on the right and on the left, you can see the last test they did before um, packing it away um, back in April to make sure that uh, the mirrors would fold up for launch. So you can see the deployment mechanism there. It's quite astonishing. And the gold plated mirrors are a thing to behold. It's quite extraordinary. Um, so that's one example of an astronomy mission. Here is a different type of mission. This one is called Solar Orbiter, and it's on its way to the sun. It's already observing the sun on its way. Um, you might wonder why we need to put a satellite into space to see the sun, well, we can see it from the Earth, but of course our atmosphere blocks out most of sunlight. There's a little bit that gets through. We know it is um, uh, visible light, that's why it gets through. And uh, we also get a few other bits of the electromagnetic spectrum. But if you want to see anything else, you've really got to get a bit closer. So this is just past Venus on its way to the sun. Um, this was in August. Um, it passed, uh, I think it was on the 8th of August. Um, so it uses the other planets in the solar system to get the orbit right so it can get closer to the sun. Um, and this is what it's um, already producing images of. And you can see when you look at it in different wavelengths, there's a lot more detail than you'd expect to see. And we're already discovering new things about how the sun operates. The arrow there indicates a thing we'd call a campfire. We have these small eruptions on the surface of the sun, which is weird because the sun itself is only at about 5,000 degrees Kelvin, but its atmosphere is at several million degrees Kelvin, which is completely counterintuitive. Uh, counter if something is hot, you'd expect the further away you get, the cooler it to be. But with the sun, there are strange things happening, all linked to its magnetic field, and this is what Solar Orbiter is trying to find out. So we need scientists to work on this sort of thing, but we also need people who can design a spacecraft that can cope with temperatures of something like the inside of a pizza oven and still operate properly and communicate with the Earth. Um, and operate for many years uh, reliably without any chance of sending somebody to fix it if something goes wrong. This is an immense engineering challenge, and we need engineers of every type who can tackle this kind of problem. Another satellite that we've been working on is on its way to Mercury. This is the Bepi Colombo satellite, another European satellite. We collaborate with partners across Europe particularly, but across the world as well. Um, so Bepi Colombo passed the day after um, a solar orbiter. So I showed you a picture of solar orbiter at Venus. This is also Venus with a Bepi Colombo um, satellite passing by using some of the momentum of its orbit to get it uh, to where it needs to be as it orbits Mercury, which is a bizarre planet where on one side of it it's hot enough to melt lead and incredibly cold on the other side. It's locked so that it more or less faces the sun with the same face the whole time, which is quite extraordinary. So we're going to understand a lot more about what the surface of Mercury is made of by monitoring it with X-rays. Moving on, though, um, this I said would be a, a rushed um, presentation, so let's talk about how we're helping people on the ground. The most obvious applications are communication satellites, but there are also things known as position, navigation and timing satellites. You've heard of GPS. Galileo and other satellites that are working to provide timing signals. They're basically clocks in space, which we use to monitor the position of things on the ground. By comparing the time it takes for a signal to reach you from several different satellites, you can pinpoint exactly where you are, how fast you're moving and in what direction. So this is all of huge importance if you're delivering cargo around the world, if you're um, navigating, if you're trying to check where your aeroplane or your um, ship or your lorry is. Um, all of these things are absolutely dependent on it, but we even use it for timing the national grid, so the electricity system uses timing from space, and even financial transactions. So you can imagine the number of jobs in many different sectors are utterly dependent on space. Um, not just engineering, but often computing jobs and many different science as well, because these things are used for, for example, monitoring the movement of whales and other fauna um, as they migrate. But then maybe more obviously, weather affects everything we're doing and we can link some of these different sorts of data together to get different messages. So this is um, an image from Meteosat, which is the principal set of weather satellites that we use. Um, this is an image of the southwest of Britain, Cornwall, where we're able to detect lithium from space. So um, geological prospecting we can do as well, um, using many different uh, wavelengths. So lithium, as you know, is vital for batteries. As we tackle climate change, we need more of this stuff. We're going to need 
lithium and it currently comes from very few places so the more places we can find it the easier it'll be but taking that theme on a little bit more to talk about climate and the environment um this is an image of the earth showing um britain surrounded by plankton blooms which usually indicate um pollution so space is extremely good for monitoring pollution um, and for monitoring things like illegal fishing here. So every ship has a transponder on board and we can track them from space. It's pretty much the only way of doing it sensibly, given how many ships there are and where they are, um, especially if they're far out at sea. But the interesting thing is that if they switch their transponder off, which is illegal, it usually means they're up to some illegal activity. We can highlight that and somebody can then investigate what they're actually doing. And in terms of monitoring how uh, climate change is affecting the Earth, this is um, an image taken in July this year of a part of uh, Siberia, which was on fire. As you can see, it's not expected to be on fire during the summertime, but given the changes in our environment, this is now becoming more frequent. And it's, again, so remote, it's far easier to monitor it from space. But even back home, sometimes it's easier to see these things from space. Um, this was in 2014 when there were colossal floods in Somerset. And you can see each of these pictures was taken a few days apart. We can monitor flooding and all, other, all sorts of other environmental disasters from space, um, whether it be tsunamis or earthquakes. Um, and we can also help with the relief aid because often you'll find that um, the infrastructure has been damaged, roads or power lines will be broken and sometimes it's only possible to see what's happening by looking from space because all the more uh, local monitoring has been um, damaged. But in terms of climate change itself, the UN parameters that are measured in order to monitor climate change Half of them can only be measured from space. Here's a couple of examples. We've got sea surface temperature on the left and salinity of the sea on the right. But there are many, many other things that would be just too difficult to measure if you tried doing it by sending out fleets of ships or people with thermometers or wind gauges or whatever across the Earth. So in order to monitor climate change, we need a long term data set, which we've now been gathering for several decades from space. And that continues to become more and more important, but also monitoring what um, people are doing to deliver their objectives under the Paris Agreement and with any luck, the Glasgow Agreement, if we get one. Um, so we need to be able to monitor what people are actually doing, what emissions there are, carbon dioxide and methane particularly. But finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, perhaps the most inspirational aspect of space for many people, which is exploration. Um, this is the Lunar Pathfinder mission, which is going to be um, on its way to the moon before too long. This is going to provide communications for all of the lunar missions that are planned by many different countries, including us, um, including Europe, including America and so on. This is actually a commercial operation which will link all these missions back to Earth. And it's being built by Surrey Satellite Technology in Surrey, as you might imagine, in the UK. So this is uh, one of the things that the UK is particularly good at, communication satellites and small satellites. We bring them together in this mission. Um, that will also support Lunar Gateway, which is Europe's next big um, uh, mission to the moon. Um, actually, it's an international mission. Um, so this is going to be uh, an orbiting station around the moon, um, which will support people on the surface of the moon um, as they start to build habitats and explore and um, research the surface of the moon. Mainly though, as a precursor to visiting Mars um, to, uh, to get a bit better insight into it, this image um, was taken um, by ExoMars um, and you can see bedding planes laid down underwater. So this is an extraordinary um, feature. Uh, there are many other features that we want to investigate on Mars and the initial stages will be sending robots such as the Rosalind Franklin rover, which was built at Stevenage in the UK. Uh, again, imagine the engineers um, work on this. It's been absolutely fascinating. How do you design a robust, reliable rover that is um, more or less autonomous, but will ins accept instructions and will cope with dusty environment, generate electricity in order to be able to carry on operating, collect samples, analyze them and so on. It's been a colossal 
exercise in the UK. And this is going to be launched next autumn, roughly a year from now, and will then be on its way to Mars. This is what it looked like as a, the flight model was being assembled. Um, you can see the outer layers have not yet been added, so you can still see what's inside it. And part of the purpose of it will be to collect samples which can be left behind to be collected later by um, sample fetch rovers and then return um, missions uh, to Mars. So we'll be able to get um, samples back on Earth. And all that will have to happen before we send people to Mars in case they contaminate the surface with our life forms from Earth, which would obviously confuse matters um, and would be very, dis dis very destructive if we did it. So everything that we're sending at the moment has been super sterilized. Hence, um, you'll have seen people wearing um, complete uh, or cover up um, uh, clean room clothes in order to protect the satellite from any kind of contamination from Earth. So then to, final, uh, to get some final thoughts then about why you might want to work in the sector, you've seen some of the things we're working on. Um, some of it includes rocket science, but it's far, far wider. There are many, many different areas of work that we're involved in, requiring lots of different skills. Um, roughly 30,000 jobs we think may be needed by 2030, so that's a colossal number. Um, and of course, you know, there are big jobs that need to be done that will earn a lot of money for people holding those jobs. But it's a collaborative um, activity with many countries around the world. So there's a lot of exploration around the world, not just exploration of other planets. Um, very international, so having that kind of attitude of uh, accepting other cultures and being able to speak other languages will set you in good stead. But there are such a variety of different jobs, um, many different things. I'm sure we'll be able to find a job that, uh, no matter what background and skills you have. Um, here's some opportunities to get a bit more um, uh, experience and learning. So the ESA Academy, that's the European Space Agency, has an academy um, which offers training um, for students. The, we run the place, Space Placements and Industry Scheme. Uh, I'll tell you more in the next slide about that. But many other organizations offer placements, and there's a few of the companies that typically offer them most years um, on the screen now. The International Space University offers both um, summer programs of about eight weeks and uh, the master's program over a year. And then there are many online courses that you can use to uh, top up your knowledge and understanding. And it's always worth looking at spacecareers.uk to get an idea about the kinds of jobs and careers that are available. SPIN then, Space Placements and Industry Scheme, this is run for us by the Space, uh, the, sorry, the Satellite Applications Catapult, probably easiest to do a search for them. Um, this is an opportunity for you to do an eight week project working with a space related organization in the UK. Um, that will be advertised to people like you from early next year once we've got the money to, to go ahead with it, but we're not allowed to announce it until it's been agreed and government funding has very strict rules about that sort of thing. And so finally, here's a few top tips. Um, I'll just leave them on the screen and uh, let you absorb those, but it's definitely worthwhile acquiring new skills, trying out challenges um, and competitions, demonstrating the breadth of knowledge that you've got and your commitment to working in space. Um, and maybe taking a membership of UK SEDS, which is the student group um, that uh, advocates for space in the UK. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to stop sharing. And I don't know whether there's any questions, but if there are, then now would be the time to ask them. Thank you. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks very much. We've, we've got probably just a couple of, of minutes before I, I hand over to our next speaker. So um, if it's OK with you, I'll just start with, with the first one. Um, so let me just group that one. So um, ask, somebody asking about, uh, what about launching astronauts from the UK? Is any rocket in development in the UK now for human certification? Uh Yes, um, there are several companies that are working on this. Um, we are, I mean, you might get a bit more actually from the next talk. Um, so uh, that would be interesting to get their take on it. So you may want to come back. I only know a certain amount. So one area is um, reaction engines who are working on amazing technology for reusable um, air breathing engines. 
and the idea will be for them to carry passengers. That's quite a long way off because the technology is still being developed now. In the meantime, Virgin um, are working on uh, passenger um, uh, launches, and with any luck at some point, some of those will happen from the UK. I don't have the details, but yes, in principle. <laughs> No worries. So that that's I'm sorry about that. We've only got time for one question before I hand over to Dave. But um, guys, if you do have any more questions, please head over to the UK Space Agency's virtual stand in the so if you just click on the virtual careers there and just carry on the conversation with Jeremy and his colleagues there. But um, thank thank you all very much and say thank you very much, Jeremy. So um, do stick around. I'll I'll hand over to our next speaker now. Um, Dave Pollard from Spaceport Cornwall, but I'll let, I'll let Dave introduce himself. But thank you very much, Jeremy, um, and I'll hand over to Dave. Cool. Hi, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Jeremy. I only, I only caught the end of Jeremy's talk, but that sounded uh, excellent. And I think I'm going to cover aspects of um, what Jeremy's talked about as well. Just to um, just to answer that previous question, um, at purely with Virgin Orbit. So Virgin Orbit are looking to launch satellites in space. Virgin Galactic, the sister company, we're, we're, we're not in any sort of forward talks with them at present and we'd have to go back through a whole council process. Um, but if um, if human transportation did start to take off, so to speak, um, who knows what the future would hold in regards to that. And I'd imagine we'd be in a fairly good position um, in, in regards to that with our relationship with Virgin already. Um, so I will just quickly share my screen. Can you see that, Nick? See the presenter mode, Dave. So that's great. I'll just uh, I'll just change yeah. that around a second. Sure. There we go. There we go. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so my name is Dave Pollard. I'm the Education Outreach Manager at Spaceport Cornwall. Um, to start off with, I just wanted to play you a short video of something that happened earlier this year. And then after this, I'll tell you why this is important to us and what plans we've got going forwards. We are currently on track for a nominal timeline and we're currently as listed in Trillion at 1925 BTC. Separation. 
So that was um, Virgin Orbit's first successful launch um, that happened in January this year. That's been about 10 years in the making from initial concept to that launch this year. To us, is because that's the exact same technology that they're going to be bringing across to Spaceport Cornwall to launch here for the first time ever from the UK next year. And it's looking likely to be somewhere around July time next year when we'll be looking towards that first launch. Um, sorry if that video was a little bit glitchy. I've, I've got a second video to show you now about um, who we are and what we do. If that's glitchy, I'm just going to move on and then talk you through um, talk you through it throughout the presentation. So hopefully that was pretty smooth for you, that, that played well for me. Um, so yeah, this is what we're gonna to get to see um, next year uh, in 2022 from Cornwall. And we're one of the one of seven um, sort of spaceports recognized in the UK. Uh, and we're one of two horizontal launch um, spaceports. Uh, and we're probably closest to, to launch um, out of those, those ones. So we're super excited about Virgin coming here next year to, to launch and be our first launch partner. And you may have seen in the news, where well, you've probably seen in the news, because um, you follow space generally, um, that there's a sort of huge increase in rocket and satellite launch. And that, that's because there's been a huge increase in satellite data and the demand for satellite data. And also the cost of satellites have come down. The size of the, the, size of the satellites have come down. So you can now get satellites the size of a lunchbox or smaller. Um, and because of this, the cost to launch and the cost to build them has also come down. And there's huge growing um, satellite demands in, in regards to agri-tech, using it for environmental concerns, looking at smart cities. Um, so the expectation is that we're going to need another roughly 30,000 small satellites in space by 2030. And I wanted to talk about some of the um, sort of areas where satellites are being used now um, that I thought are, are quite interesting. So in regards to farming, um, farmers can now use satellites, not just in regards to sort of autonomous tractors to be able to use GPS data to take uh, to, to sort of plow a whole field, but also to look at their, their crops. So by using um, sort of color monitoring satellites um, to look at their entire fields, 
They're able to identify specific areas that might not be the correct color. And then they can use drones that use that sort of satellite um, GPS data to, to take very detailed so the farmers can see whether those areas need pesticides or fertilizer. And rather than do a whole field, they will just focus that on specific areas. And that will save time, resource, and be better for the environment. Also looking at illegal fishing, um, satellites are particularly good for, for tracking and monitoring boats. Um, and there's also um, talk about being able to look at the wake that different boats um, create. So you can see um, what sort of weight uh, are within those boats and whether that's, that can be accurate to what they're saying that, that, that they've been doing and what sort of cargo they've got on board. A lot of our environmental knowledge comes from satellites. I think it's about 50% of our sort of environmental knowledge comes from satellites because they're able to get a true picture um, of a whole country or a whole continent um, rather than just being able to focus on a small area. So this is um, a, a satellite called Sentinel-5P, which has been launched for environmental reasons. And this is looking at nitrogen dioxide over the course of a week uh, in the UK. So in the top right hand corner there, you can see the day of the week. Um, and then the areas of red is where there's high concentration levels of nitrogen dioxide. So you can see that in the city areas of sort of London, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, from Monday to Friday, there's quite high levels of nitrogen dioxide um, identified. Over the weekend, this drops off completely. So from this, we might be able to take this sort of people commuting to, to work or to school um, that is having quite a, quite a high impact on, on the nitrogen dioxide levels. And it's going to be really interesting with um, COVID to see how this has changed across the UK. Because, but it's only by using satellite data and tracking this information that we're able to see whether changes that we make on the ground are having an impact. So to lead on to this next um, slide. So um, this is a, a picture of Italy. And on the left is pre-COVID and on the right is during COVID. And that was looking at carbon dioxide levels in those areas. And okay. Sorry, Hi. sorry, to I've, lost, I've lost your slides there. Um, I've just had a slight error message pop up. So would you mind just sort of resharing your screen again? I'm really sorry. Think yeah, no worries, don't worry. <laughs> so, like, uh, sorry to where did you where, where did you get to? Um, but so we literally just lost a slide before you were going to move on. So Okay, so um, right, you, you've seen you've seen that one. So yeah, we've seen that one. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, just yeah, just the, seems, seems to be back now. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. That, that's okay. It's uh, the fun fun and games of technology, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the slide that I was talking about in regards to Italy. Um, they they looked at the carbon dioxide levels uh, pre COVID, which which is on the left here, and carbon dioxide levels during COVID which is on the right. And, and this, this imagery from satellites uh, uh, actually got a, a huge sort of level of interest in Italy on, on social media. And a lot of public pressure was put onto the government to make changes based on this imagery. And they have actually made changes to many of the city areas to lower the carbon dioxide levels. And that, and that was all based on this imagery um, and, and this tracking of, of that data. So it really is by tracking it, we're able to make changes and also see the impact that those changes have been made. So in regards to the opportunity for us and the UK, so the UK government has, has targeted the, the UK with capturing 10% of the global 400 billion pound space economy by 2030. We currently manufacture a good proportion of the world's satellites, but we have no launch capability. So that's what that's why sort of seven or eight years ago, the government asked who was interested in hosting um, a spaceport. We tentatively put up our hand for a horizontal launch spaceport and were chosen. So within the next sort of one to five years, we should see a number of sites being able to able to launch next year um, and be able to actually launch some of the UK satellites themselves. In regards to opportunities for Cornwall, um, at Space for Cornwall, we're talking about 150 direct jobs um, and a further 240 in the supply chain, um, and economic growth for Cornwall of 240 million pounds. 
something really important to me in my sort of um, outreach and education role is the opportunity to inspire a generation of young people um, that, that I'm particularly passionate about and also being able to take a global lead in sustainable space. So um, we were the first spaceport in the world to carry out a full environmental impact and carbon um, assessment of our activities. Um, and we're looking to offset those um, and be a carbon neutral spaceport. Um, and we want others to be able to look at what we're doing and think, yeah, this is possible. Um, and, to, and to take that stance on, on being environment, as environmental as possible and also launching satellites that are gonna benefit us long-term as a society. In regards to the opportunity to inspire a generation of young people, um, during the Apollo program in the US, they saw a huge um, increase in students studying STEM subjects. I always like to talk about STEAM because I like to include the arts. So it's science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. Um, but in the US, they saw a huge spike in students studying STEM subjects right up to PhD level. And I think we've got an opportunity over the next sort of few years as we're looking at launch in the UK and the amount of um, coverage increases to really inspire a generation of young people into STEM. Whether or not they come and work in the space sector, um, to me, isn't quite as important. It's about having that wide base of young people with that knowledge to help us in so many different sectors and the hope of, of you know, a good number of those coming into the space sector. So recent developments locally, you may have seen in the news um, that Blue Abyss um, are planning to um, set up um, on the on the airport and spaceport site. Um, so that's going to be a 50 meter deep pool um, that can be used for the, the likes of training of astronauts um, or, or having people in um, deep spaces that, that can feel similar to space. Um, so that they were on site yesterday to look around. Um, and that's a huge development in regards to the space cluster locally. We've already got sort of world-class mission control facilities with Goon Hilly. We'll have launch. Now we'll have this astronaut training area. Um, you know, hopefully soon we may look at sort of satellite manufacturers and the likes to really develop that, that cluster further. Um, and Virgin Orbit are one of our um, launch partners. They're our first, um, but we've also signed a memorandum of understanding with Sierra Space. So Sierra Space, um, the rocket you see there on, on the right-hand side, they're a vertical launch, but a horizontal land site. So we've initially signed uh, an agreement to be one of their emergency landing zones um, but in the future, it could be the case that they launch from somewhere and then they land back here with sort of UK research or UK astronauts that have come back from the International Space Station. We're also building a, a few buildings on site. So we're developing a satellite integration facility, which is where the satellites will be put into the rocket prior to being launched. And this is essentially a giant clean room. Um, and this is an area that in the future, if something like Sierra Space did come back with research missions, then we could also carry out the research on site through this building and through a center for space technologies, which we're also developing on site. Um, and, and that's gonna be home to many SMEs, but also academia. Um, and it's already sort of oversubscribed and it's due to be built um, in, in a sort of June, May, June time next year. Another development for us is that on the first launch, we're going to have um, a Kernosat-1. So this has been funded through the, the UK Space Agency. Um, and Kernosat-1 is, is going to be launched um, with an environmental mission for Cornwall, but something that can be scalable um, for the rest of the UK or for the rest of the world. So this initial um, Kernosat-1 will be looking at um, ocean clarity. We set a project to one of our local universities um, for them to come up with ideas of sort of uh, how uh, Kernosat 1 could be used. Um, and one of them came back with something similar to what we were already thinking about, was actually monitoring the oceans around Cornwall to look at where might be a feasible place to have a, a kelp forest. Um, so kelp is a particularly good carbon sink, um, but it also grows very quickly and can be harvested um, and turned into biofuel. We already have a good amount of kelp around Cornwall, but there's, it's very difficult without using satellites to be able to tell how healthy it is, whether it's growing, whether it's decreasing, and where may be the next sort of perfect place to, to develop a, a kelp forest if we were looking to try and use that to, to offset. 
Um, so the University of Exeter student created a um, feasibility study for this. And that is what the mission of Koenigsat 1 will be by using buoys in the ocean, the data, data around sort of ocean clarity, swell, acidity, um, will be sent back up to a satellite to be to be brought back down probably to look at the data around where maybe the sort of best place to house that. And Kernosat 1 is called Kernosat 1 because we're hoping to have Kernosat 2 and there's already plans um, in regards to that and also Kernosat 3, Kernosat 4 and so on as we launch more rockets over time. For you in regards to the sort of space sector in the UK. Talking about jobs and, and not, you know, that's Tim Peake, an astronaut on, on one side of this, but more about jobs on the other side of this page. So in regards to the upstream about putting things into space, talking about spaceport operations, space plane and rocket systems, payload integration, propulsion systems. If the sort of estimate of another 32,000 small sats by 2030 is correct, we're gonna need all of these skills to, to actually help get them up there. Um, also gonna need aerospace engineers. So the people that look at the problems, that fix the problems, that build um, the, the sort of equipment that we need and the satellites that we need. You know, I think it's widely known that there's a shortage of engineers in, in many sectors, I, I don't think that's any different in the space sector, and we need those skills to be coming through from the universities to be able to create, create those products of the future. So that's in regards to the upstream, but in regards to the downstream, so once we've launched those satellites and once that data is coming back down to Earth, how do we use that data to uh, create new products, create new services, um, to, to really support us uh, in, in the future. And that's where I see a huge amount of opportunity in that downstream application side. So I thought I'd look into space sector routes a little bit. There's, there's um, a few apprenticeships that have started off. Um, so the uh, space engineering technician apprenticeship has started with Airbus. And also there's a college locally that is about to offer that. Um, but about 63% of the jobs within the space that degree level qualification. Um, so UCAS on the other side of that page is particularly good for looking at courses. And I think a lot of you will be at university already, but for those of you who are at college or younger looking at university courses, here are some that, that are highlighted on, on that UCAS website. So things like aerospace engineering, uh, aerospace, uh, space science and robotics, because robotics is a really growing field. And in the downstream side, things like web design and development. And that UCAS website has got all 37,000 unique level university courses that you can study. So really take a look at that. Another good website is the Space Careers website. Um, so there's about 70 jobs currently advertised on there. And if you are going through your education at the moment, it's good to sort of find a job and then work backwards and see what skills you would need um, to, to get those jobs in the future. My final slide um, is just a few recommendations. And I, I know Jeremy covered some of these as well. Um, so the Space Careers.uk website is really good. Um, if you are at university now, look at the UK Space Agency Space Placements and Industry, the SPIN term programme. We have three SPIN terms this year and they're phenomenal, um, but and they've got experience and been paid to have that experience. Um, so do apply for that. It's really competitive, but if you can get a place on that, it, it can really set you up for the future. Engage, you know, follow companies, uh, engage with the staff on, on, on their social media platforms um, and, you know, just get yourself known and, and learn more about it. Look at competitions, um, some that Jeremy said earlier as well, but there's a NanoSat competition to come up, get a team together uh, wherever you are and, and enter that NanoSat competition. That's a 600,000 pounds competition. Um, look at some UK SEDS competitions. And, and if you are at university, join your UK SEDS, SEDS group. Um, look at different company competitions and possibly the Spaceport America Cup if you're interested in actually you know, trying to build rockets and put them up into space. Like I said, um, follow businesses and people on social media. Um, Kathy Bowden um, for the U from the UK Space Agency is particularly good on LinkedIn um, and, and often has uh, has opportunities. And don't be shy about looking at setting up a new business. You know, there are incubation spaces. There is support for, for students wanting to set up businesses. Um, and the space sector is growing so quickly that that is huge opportunity to, to set up a new business and really get your foot through the door. Um, and set something up for life. That's very quickly for me. I think I slightly overran, so I apologize about that, Nick, but if there are, is any time for questions, then I'm happy to take them. If not, I am gonna um, man hour, so 
please feel free to to get in touch thanks very much dave yeah so um questions guys please head over and carry on the conversation with dave in the spaceport cornwall virtual um video chat room so and do go and carry on the conversation there with dave but yeah thank, thank you very much dave and i'm just going to hand over to our next speaker now so thanks very much thanks, Nick. thank you Cheers. So I'd just like to welcome um, Karen, who's uh, from Zillion Pilot, who's going to introduce the next topic. But I'll, Karen, I'll, I'll let you carry on as we're sort of slightly over, but um, don't don't worry too much. But um, I'll let you you carry on. Thanks very much. Over to Karen. Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much for inviting me along today. Um, I've had a few technical problems this morning as well, so I might need you to share my slides for me or end if you wouldn't mind, Nick. Um, Not Thank you. Um, so um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining uh, the event today. And thank you to Nick and to the Royal Aeronautical Society um, for hosting it and for inviting us to, to be part of it. It's great to be here. Uh, my name's Karen Bath. I'm one of the co-founders at Resilient Pilot, which you may or may not have heard of, but hopefully I can now take this opportunity to introduce you to us as an organization and explain how we might be able uh, to help you going forward. Um, so slightly different angle here in that we focus specifically on the commercial, um, more specifically on the airline side of things, but actually becoming a, a pilot in the commercial world or becoming a member of cabin crew in the commercial world. So um, I know that most of today has been very much focused on on the defence aerospace side of things and space. I've just been listening to, to that talk from Dave, who wouldn't want to be a spaceman. I don't know. <laughs> there we go. If you'd like to be a commercial pilot or commercial crew, then maybe we can help you. And maybe we can help you as well with the space decision, because the main focus of what we offer at Resilient Pilot is free support. So that's right at the top there. And um, the main focus of what we offer is mentoring. So this presentation will just really give you a quick kind of virtual tour around what we can do as an organization to support you as you make your career decisions going forwards. And the whole idea from this aspect of Resilient Pilot is to help the future pilots and crew make informed career decisions. Um, so go in with a knowledgeable base when you start making decisions and investing money on your future training or uh, joining a, a career programme, whatever it might be with an organisation. So um, next slide, please, Nick, if you wouldn't mind. So this is just a little bit of an introduction to Resilient Pilot um, for you. So um, myself and, and, and uh, Stuart Beach, who is um, a senior first officer for one of uh, the UK's leading airlines, he and I were chatting prior to the pandemic about um, a project that we're really passionate and that is about encouraging a wider diversity of individuals uh, to join the airline industry so to make opportunities for people perhaps who come from a poorer background or a less financial stable background um, and more diverse groups in general to be able to access the industry um, that was a project we were working on covid hit hard as we all know and it was obvious that actually our, actually our focus needed to change at that particular point to provide some support for the existing pilots and cabin crew who were losing their jobs quite rapidly all around the world at that particular point so resilient pilot was set up specifically in mind to provide support for the pilot and cabin crew community at that particular point but our longer term goal is to link back to that original project that Stu and I were working on, um, but also to, even in the intervening period, provide support for aspiring pilots and aspiring cabin crew to help them, as I said earlier, make informed career decisions. So a quick intro to who we are. We launched in April 2020, rapid response um, to the COVID impact. Um, originally, we were setting up a mentoring team to provide mentoring supports for newly graduated pilots who were coming out of flight training providers um, into a world where the job prospects were minimal and certainly in the distant future at that particular point. As we were setting up, airlines around the world announced redundancies and it became very evident that that support was going to be needed for the wider pilot community. Since we've set up, we've also extended that support to cabin crew and we have an international reach, as, just, as you'll see in just a second. Um, this model here that you can see is a model that we developed in the early days 
um, and it demonstrates very clearly our foundations and what we, we try and focus on. So obviously people who lost their jobs, well-being was of great concern and continues to be of great concern, but it's not just job loss that can, can impact your well-being. So there's a whole whole gamut of things that can impact your well-being. And actually, if you're to relate it to people considering their next career decision, actually how you mind, how you navigate through the minefield of the different opportunities, the different training routes, the different programs that are available, that can, that can put you into a bit of a, a confused state so your well-being can be impacted basically everything that we do is focused on helping to maintain positive well-being and well where perhaps your well-being isn't in the best place helping you find ways to actually move it incremental gains to move it into a more positive place in the commercial world um, pilots in particular are very aware of the it depends which part of the world you're in eight or nine competencies that training departments focus on so those gray circles you can see around the well-being heart there they are the eighth stroke nine there are nine on there um, because we've embraced the full nine uh, competencies that all pilot training is based upon um, and what we figured is that pilots who are don't have the support of an airline training provider or an airline access to simulators training departments etc so those who've been furloughed made redundant or are between jobs either having just graduated and waiting for their first job or for whatever reason these skills these competencies could become rusty so we wanted to put facilities in place to help you maintain exercise those competencies to keep them as sharp as possible for when recruitment opportunities return and around the outside there of our foundations is that is the diversity it goes back to that original goal of ours to try and increase diversity in the industry it's a pretty diverse industry but whichever way you look at it that side of things can always improve so part of that is encouraging people into the industry and helping them to make informed decisions about their careers for you hopefully you've been able to read some of the other points that are on there at the moment but the main point for you to take away from this is that we provide a free service we're a not-for-profit organization we're run by volunteers we're supported by volunteers and you can get free support from us through mentoring support through the resources that our, that our um, volunteers have produced. We're totally independent of operators, regulators and training organisations. So any mentoring relationship you might build with our team can be uh, you can be totally assured of absolute discretion. Um, so if you were connected with an organisation or you're considering moving jobs, for example, and you didn't want your employer to know, you can be totally, totally uh, reassured of that discretion from our team. But where there is regulation linked to what we do, we try to align everything that we do with that regulation so that we can at least as close as possible have parity to it. Uh, next slide, please, Nick, if you wouldn't mind. Keeping you awake here. <laughs> So this is our story so far from something that didn't exist. In fact, we didn't, you know, oh, we didn't, uh, we didn't even foresee it existing. Uh, it's growing quite rapidly organically through, through word of mouth. So you can see the various stats on there as well as I can read them out to you. But a couple of key points to home in on. Uh, one, we, um, we work closely with an organisation organization called the Centre for Aviation Psychology. In the airline world, certainly within the UK earlier this year, it became mandatory for airlines to provide peer support programs for their pilots. Most airlines have extended that beyond the pilot workforce to other employees within the organization. And CAP is one of the leading providers of peer support. Why I mention that is because what Resilient Pilot offers um, is well-being support but if somebody came to us with specific concerns about their well-being and we felt our mentoring team weren't specifically equipped to help with that we can signpost people to cap for some deeper level support in that particular area we also work on the easa well-being collaboration group we've been massively supported by the caa and at that we work we run webinars every week and the caa have supported a number of those webinars and they've used those what those webinars as a direct voice um, to the pilot community in particular. Flight Global have support, supported us by giving free advertising to be able to promote uh, the service to the pilot community or the wider pilot community. And EMCC is something you might not be familiar with. I'll talk about in just a, in just a moment, but we've aligned our mentoring and coaching techniques to those of the EMCC. But those four logos down the right-hand side, they're probably more relevant to today. So one, 
we work closely with the Royal Aeronautical Society. I'm a fellow um, and Stu has been working very closely with the careers department on a number of initiatives. And uh, that's why we're massively grateful to be invited along today. Two, you heard from Richard Smith earlier today um, of the Aviation Skills Retention Platform. So we're very with the Aviation Skills Retention Platform. And what we're trying to do is secure not necessarily secure but try and explore avenues of funding if we can secure it great but explore different avenues to allow for funding for pilots and crew to in particular for us anyway to maintain those skills it can be really expensive for example to hire a simulator to do a license proficiency check at which most pilots want to do and need to do every year to stay up to date um, and if you're in, in employment at the moment, but perhaps in employment that doesn't pay as much as you, as you as a, as a, as you, you, you've built your lifestyle around from your previous piloting career, um, then that funding is not available at the moment. And we're hopeful that through avenues like TRS, the Aviation Skills Retention Platform, there may be additional uh, funding pockets out there to benefit from. So we're working closely with them. Department for Work and Pensions, uh, there is funding available through the DWP. We are a DWP approved um, route, so people can get their SIM checks done, but you have to be on, on universal credit to benefit from that sort of funding. But what we've been hugely proud about is despite the fact that we're an employee, sorry, a volunteer run, we don't generate uh, much revenue, only enough income to cover our costs, such as hosting a website, etc. But we have been approved by the government kickstart scheme and through this year we've been able to employ paid for by the government thank you um, a, a number of young people away from universal credit to give them a kickstart on their careers and we've had to date four young people join us on the kickstart scheme it's a six month contract and we're currently looking for four other people to join us on the kickstart kickstart scheme so if anybody out there has skills in it helping develop learning management systems in marketing social media general customer support we have four roles uh, that would be funded by the government on a six-month contract to come and work with us and help us uh, further develop what we're offering um, uh, the pilot and cabot crew community so have a look on our website resilientpilot.com for more details on that uh, next slide please Stu uh, sorry not Stu <laughs> Nick you can tell tell the normal partnership sorry <laughs> So um, this slide is, is really a summary of what we're trying to be. We're trying to be world class whilst we're not, as I say, aligned to a regulator. We try to do what we can. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, do what we can to uh, produce world class products. But and our volunteers have produced some incredible resources. Please do hop over to the website. The majority of them are free. They've all been developed by our volunteers and they are fantastic. We have a resource hub. We have some, some workshops called competency development scenarios, which for those of you who have some uh, piloting knowledge will know that um, things like desktop loft exist in the airline pilot training environment. These are like desktop loft scenarios where you work through a flight deal with different challenges and use all of those nine competencies I was talking about earlier so you exercise them. So we're virtual, we're a mentoring and coaching organisation and we're all about trying to provide opportunities for continual personal and professional development which is something that's being considered and, and um, embraced more and more in the world of commercial aviation. Perhaps it hasn't been done so much in the past, but it's certainly going forward is uh, doing more along those lines. So that's what we're trying to provide for those who aren't directly supported by an airline themselves because of their current situation. Next slide, please, Nick. <laughs> Got it right this time. Um, they take a while to, there you go. So um, this gives you an idea. This is a snapshot a couple of days ago of our website traffic. We are international now, just to give you some idea of the international reach of those people coming to the website for support. So it's a really small insight slide, that one. Uh, next slide, please, Nick. So as I said earlier, the main focus of what we provide is free mentoring and coaching. We have volunteer mentors who've come to us from around the globe and they all have different types of experience. Um, 
people often ask us what is mentoring we'll have a, a quick slide on that in just a second um, but um, mentoring can be anything you want it to be and to, to snapshot it it's about finding a thinking partner if you're trying to think through things you're the thinker and your mentor is your thinking partner your thinking partner can help you consider what you need to think about can help direct you and point you in the right direction to find the solutions to the challenges that you might be facing whatever those might be they might be well-being focused they might be about finding a new career choice they might be about how do i keep my skills maintained they could be all sorts of things anything varied and our mentors come from a really varied background there's a snapshot there some of them are newly qualified pilots themselves who've just navigated their career choices so you could pick their brains to learn a little bit more and you can see there also they've got all levels of experience from different types of operation um, and also we have a number of specialist mentors and coaches who come to us with specialist skills all again offered for free um, if that's something that you're feeling you need support with so again have a look on the website have a look on the supported tab on our website and you can meet all of the mentors virtually there and choose which ones you prefer to connect with and that's unique with resilient pilot as well most organizations would pair you with a mentor without you having a choice as to which mentor you're connected with but here you can find someone that you feel you could better connect with uh, next slide please nick Thank you. So I mentioned earlier, what is mentoring? Um, we've done a lot of work on this as an organization and we've brainstormed what mentoring is for the resilient pilot um, approach. So this mind map here gives you a little bit of an insight into that. This is what your mentor, your thinking partner, focus on will do for you will steer you in the right direction too and I mentioned earlier the European Mentoring and Coaching Council um, we have a number of our mentors who are accredited by this and uh, we facilitate the opportunity for our mentors to get an EMCC accreditation so European Mentoring and Coaching Council um, gives you that sort of gold standard level of mentoring so even though we're a volunteer run organization as I mentioned earlier we're trying to deliver a gold standard service just because you can't necessarily afford mentoring um, doesn't mean that you should you should have to take away a lesser lesser standard support network provide that support network for people who, who perhaps can't normally afford it or aren't don't have access to it through their workplace so that's that's what mentoring means to us as an organization our mentors won't give you answers they'll help you find the answers and actually that's far more empowering that's about personal and professional development if you know how to find the answers you become more self-sufficient and autonomous going forward in making your career choices in the future so it's about giving you that foundation to help you build upon <clears throat> next slide please nick Okay, so this is what why we're here today. It's about helping tomorrow's pilots, that could be you um, and crew, make informed career decisions. We have three pillars that we base what we offer on. Supported is very much about the mentoring I've been talking about. Current is probably more geared towards a pilot or cabin crew member who's already qualified, has or is is a, is waiting for their first job, or has been furloughed or made redundant. But actually, I was talking to somebody in the virtual room earlier today who held a commercial pilot's license, is not yet ready to join an airline because they have the final stage of training to do, um, but has obviously through having pilot's license um, got some currency that they want to be able to keep fresh so they hopefully will connect with a mentor our mentors can do these one-to-one -one sessions with them run through scenarios with them and exercise all of those muscles in the brain that perhaps haven't been exercised recently because they've not had access to an aircraft um, to practice those all important competencies and the airlines are most concerned more about the non-technical skills having gone rusty during this period of time than the actual handling and technical skills they tend to come back we've all heard the phrase it's like riding a bike the technical skills come back because they're so well trained in but it's the non-technical skills that are harder to keep fresh so talking through scenarios with people is a really great way of doing that armchair flying for those of you who've got a pilot background we often talk about armchair flying sit in your chair and just go through what's going what a normal flight would involve so if you've got any flying skill and you want to maintain that knowledge the current pillar, pillar that we offer has access to a resource hub, which has all sorts of uh, resources developed by our mentors, all for free, and also access to the competency development scenarios. We have two, th two different uh, membership tiers. One is a free membership tier. You can get 
what three competency development scenarios free so that's three one-hour workshops for free but if you sign up to the monthly subscription which is 10 pounds a month you have an unlimited supply of competence development scenarios at your fingertips and the other pillar we 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 uh, we we operate under is keeping you connected this is about uh, we run webinars every week to keep you keep you connected to the industry they're free webinars we run uh, workshops and we're running some workshops later this year on cv skills um getting your cv right interview skills i should have said and it's not so much about practicing interviews it's more about making you think so again you've got that autonomy you're going to be capable yourself of thinking yourself through an interview where perhaps an off the wall question comes at you rather than having rehearsed answers to questions that everybody says are interviews make sure you've actually got that autonomous confidence to be able to respond to whatever question might come your way so our connected workshops will provide you with opportunities to do that and going forward as there are more opportunities um, to apply for back in the aviation industry we hope to be able to connect you up with those as well so those are the three pillars and those are the kind of things we're doing with mentees all the time at the moment next slide please nick okay that's me that's finished i have literally no idea how long i took there because i didn't take note of what time we started in the end so i'm hoping i'm sort of within the 20 minutes apologies if i've overrun have i <laughs> but um, that's me i'm trying to man your man the virtual room this afternoon i've had a few uh, tech problems with it but um drop me a message or just send us an email at info at resilientpilot.com if you have any questions come visit the website thanks a lot again Thanks, Karen. Thank you very much. So yeah, do go and have a chat with Karen in the virtual room. Hopefully, tech issues will sort itself out. I find just logging on and logging out again tends to solve that issue, I think, hopefully, I'll try that. <laughs> <laughs> as is the way with IT. But uh, what I'll do now is um, I'll hand over to um, Isabella from, from Airbus. So, so with, without further ado, I'll just hand straight over to, to Isabella. Thank you. Hello, Nick, and hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so I'm Isabella from Boeing, um, and I'm here today to talk to you um, about my engineering graduate scheme experience. Um, so good afternoon, and and thank you for joining this this talk. Um, I'm currently on the engineering graduate scheme at Boeing, and I want to give you a little bit of an insight into my journey so far as an early career engineer. Um, I'll start off with a short introduction on how I entered the industry before exploring my experience um, on the graduate scheme so far. And then at the end of the talk, I'll share some of my own points um, that I've learned over the past year or so. You can take away how much a, a graduate scheme can offer and support you or any sort of um, early career scheme that you might be. So um, looking at this slide here, I studied systems engineering at the University of Warwick and I graduated in July 2020. The course at Warwick started as general engineering for the first two years. So I used this opportunity to explore the different types of engineering and just try and figure out my interests. I decided in the end to specialize in systems engineering um, in my third year. Um, as I particularly enjoyed modeling, simulation, um, control concepts, and basically how you can look at a system um, for, and its behavior, for example, an aircraft, by just using a model built from equations. So during my time at Warwick, um, I also used internship opportunities to explore engineering disciplines and gain industry experience. I completed my first internship in the civil engineering sector with High Speed 2, so very different to where I am today. This was a useful three months, um, giving me the appreciation for some of the university business modules that I was studying at the time, um, while also figuring out that maybe civil engineering wasn't necessarily for me. I spent my second internship in California for three months working at the Tesla Fremont factory in the metrology team. And I was really interested in electric cars at the time, which is why I, I sort of looked at what opportunities there were out there for me to get involved. As part of this internship, I looked at measurement procedures and data that was collected for quality purposes um, across the manufacture of cars. So this was a really fast paced and exciting environment um, where I had the opportunity to gain that exposure to automotive manufacturing, but also noting that it is still different to where I am today. 
So my final year project at Warwick was as a systems engineer for the University of Warwick um, satellite team. This project was all around designing and manufacturing a CubeSat, a small satellite that would be used to demonstrate a new technology for wildlife tracking. Through this opportunity, I was able to go on some uh, European Space Agency courses and um, eventually present our project at ESA in the Netherlands as well. And this is what really kick-started my interest in aerospace and aviation um, and also urged me to get um, a bit more exposure to systems engineering outside of my university course. So I really wanted to understand the application of systems engineering to industry projects, and that is the reason why I applied to Boeing. So the graduate scheme at Boeing uh, appealed to me as I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do, but it still offered me the flexibility and the, the different opportunities to explore different areas of the business while um, building my aerospace knowledge, because that aerospace knowledge I didn't have before about a year ago. Um, it wasn't part of my degree and I didn't experience any um, aerospace internships or work experience prior to that. So as you can see on the slide, um, apart from the internships and, and the university courses, I've also taken part in opportunities to help promote engineering and inspire future engineers as well. So I used my time as outreach officer at the Warwick Engineering Society to participate in and lead some outreach projects. Um, and one of my favorite events with this uh, was with a group of girl guides and involved building newspaper towers and an aluminium foil circuit to build to basically power an LED at the top of the tower. So it was really nice to see, you know, all their determination and their teamwork um, to build that tallest tower. Um, and since joining Boeing, I've been able to sort of build that outreach, um, build those outreach activities a little bit further so that we can now um, interact with schools virtually um, to, to bring them similar types of experiments and, and um, understanding the physics of flight, for example. Since graduating from university, I'm now also part of the Women's Engineering Society um, Early Careers Board, so I can sort of continue to showcase engineering from that perspective as well. So um, coming towards the end of that road now, um, as part of the graduate scheme at Boeing, um, I rotate through four six-month placements, so that takes um, the they, that takes the full two year scheme. Um, and this basically gives me that opportunity to explore the different teams, different roles um, um, that, are, that, that are there for us to, to explore. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail now on, on my placements so far um, and give you a bit of an insight to that. So since joining Boeing, um, I've completed two placements and I've just started my third. I'm about a month in. My first placement was with the training systems engineering team in Bristol. The training systems engineering team are focused on understanding what simulators we need in order to train pilots, mission crew and maintainers. So um, Karen was talking earlier about um, pilot training and she mentioned some um, opportunities to do that via SIMS. Um, so this would be the, uh, the way that um, pilots would, would use simula simulators and we're looking at how, what are the requirements in order to build those simulators? What do we need in order for them to, to do their job properly? So during the six months, I learned all about how simulators work and it gave me the opportunity to explore different aircraft systems as well that are used on the flight deck of an airplane, something that I didn't have experience with before. Um, you can see a system breakdown that I created of a full flight simulator. So this moves in all directions um, on the right hand side of the screen. Training systems engineers basically need to consider everything from the motion of the simulator to the sound effects of the environment and communication um, that any communications that the pilots might have, for example, with air traffic control. We also need to make sure that when a pilot flips a switch or provides a control input, that the simulator will react accordingly and it feels as if you were in the actual aircraft. 
I really enjoyed thinking about all of these different concepts and, and aspects that have to come together and um, was able to write a few requirements for a mission simulator during my six month placement. I was also really lucky to go and visit some of the simulators that we have across the different Boeing sites in the UK um, and got the opportunity to fly one too. So that was my first placement um, based in Bristol and something that the, the graduate scheme sort of um, has in their in their agenda is that you are able to locate um, across different areas of, of the UK um, and explore different areas while you're doing um, the, the placements because they're all based in different different locations. So for my second placement, um, in order to sort of try and find something that was still along the modeling and simulation aspect, because I found that quite interesting in my first placement, I went around and just talked to people across the business to see if there were other areas in Boeing UK that um, would have a similar um, background, but, but maybe using modeling and simulation for different applications. And this is how I came across Phantom Works International. So I'm currently based in Fleet, Hampshire, and I'm part of the PWI UK team. So we work with other teams in Australia, in India and other countries um, as part of an applied research and development arm of Boeing. We use modeling and simulation to explore new areas and ideas um, so that we can start to think about what we might need in the next five to 10 years of the market. This placement has given me exposure to systems and software engineering, um, and I've been able to develop some of my coding skills to help build the simulations that we um, that we use to test those ideas and those new um, concepts in a virtual environment. The team um, is also involved in rapid design and prototyping of new ideas. And this is what I'm more focused on now as a systems engineering um, graduate for my third placement. So I've stayed with the team for my second and third placement now. Um, I've also had the opportunity to work with different teams across Boeing as Phantom Works um, International looks at um, addressing some of the sustainability topics. So Boeing released its first ever sustainability report this year and we are collectively trying to work across the business um, to address those aims that are, that are stated in that report. Um, it's been a really different aspect to, of my placement and but also a great way to, to network across the company. So that, that's a sort of quick overview of my placements so far um, and now what I wanted to give you is a bit of a uh, an insight into what my day-to-day -day activities might include, um, noting that these have changed across different placements um, and they vary depending on the projects that we're currently working on. So at the moment, some of my day-to-day -day activities include um, evaluating product concepts, um, and this is all around early design and performing trade studies and comparisons to look at the benefits and challenges that we, that we might come across when choosing a specific system um, or identifying a specific design. Um, we also have quite a few lunch and learn sessions that happen across the Boeing. So lunch and learn sessions are just sort of one hour um, speaker sessions where um, a, t a topic will be discussed by someone within Boeing. Um, it might be a more of a panel discussion. So you have different representatives from across Boeing and they all talk about one topic. <clears throat> There's also an opportunity to ask any questions at the end. So it's a really good way of building a better understanding of the larger company. Um, there's so much going on. It's sometimes hard to keep track of it all. Um, I also also sort of in my day to day having meetings and, and completing some training, but that um, isn't just with uh, my colleagues in the UK. We also um, interact quite a lot with those in the US and Australia. So trying to manage the day and making sure that you have um, sort of identified the right um, meeting time for everyone um, to, to accommodate time zones can be um, can be something that I'm doing as well. 
Um, Karen also mentioned mentoring in her in her talk earlier, and uh, this is something that I have sort of really benefited from while I've been at Boeing. So I have uh, regular catch ups with my mentor and mentors can be formal, um, but they can also be informal. So they could be someone in your team that you're working with um, and they're just there to sort of support you. Um, provide any bits of advice um, and it works both ways. So something that we're now looking at in Boeing is all around uh, reverse mentoring and how <clears throat> um, those who've just started can learn from those who are really experienced, but also vice versa. So something that um, I've also taken part in um, since joining are some defense conferences, just going out there and, and seeing what's in industry and what's taking um, sort of the, the forefront at the moment to see what they're, where they're going, um, what's happening and just building general knowledge. Um, it's been really useful to have that as you're going along in your placements, try to get the bigger picture. Um, more on sort of my placement work, I've been looking at coding um, some of the simulations for those projects that I mentioned earlier. Um, and this has sort of involved me learning Python from scratch. Um, we had a little bit of, of experience with that at university, but <clears throat> it's just to show that um, you don't stop learning when you've started on a graduate scheme or you've started your early career. Um, you have to be willing to, to keep absorbing all of that information and, and try new things. And then something that I really didn't see myself doing um, at Boeing, but um, has sort of come about is researching startups, um, because we're currently looking at, um, you know, how can we collaborate with small companies um, and startups so that we can um, build the aerospace sector um, and, and make it really, um, innovative and and um, address those future challenges. So I've been looking at some of the applications that we've got through for the Boeing Accelerator program. <clears throat> and that's been really, really interesting. Um, but also, you know, trying to take in what companies might look for, how company, how startups are set up themselves, and how they get going. So that's a bit of a, um, an overview on my day-to-day -day activities. Um, and that's sort of very placement specific, but outside of placements, there are so many opportunities within Boeing to get involved and develop your early career. Um, for example, Boeing has resource groups that I've been able to join. So these include Boeing Generation to Generation and Boeing Women Inspiring Leadership. Um, these, these groups organize a range of talks and events similar to the lunch and learns that I mentioned earlier, um, and everyone's invited to them. Boeing Generation to Generation is a new resource group in Europe that I've helped set up with other people across the business. So people who are working in Germany, people who are working in France, um, it's a really good way to um, connect all of the different generations across Boeing Europe because we have quite a few people who are looking at retiring and we want to make sure that we keep that knowledge that they have that experience um, but it's also really good for just developing your network. It's been um, quite interesting to hear from all the different sort of company managers in these talks and um, how they've got to where they are today, but also ask those questions during the sessions. Um, something else that I sort of mentioned earlier at the beginning of my talk was STEM. Um, so I've been able to get involved um, with organizing and leading some of the virtual STEM activities that we've um, set up during COVID. And you can see a few examples of what we, we try and um, share with the pupils at the schools. Um, whether it's uh, principles of flight um, or just learning more about Boeing. Um, I think it's been a really good way to promote engineering. And then the final two points sort of work together because it comes back to that networking um, area. And networking can sometimes be a bit intimidating, um, but it's been, you know, you sort of have to put yourself out there um, Ask, ask those questions because um, you're not going to, to come about the, the answers without looking for the information. Um, so I would just sort of try and say that 
even if you feel a little bit nervous about doing it, um, reach out to people um, when you start, or even at, if you're at university at the moment, start reaching out to people because um, you can make a lot of good, um, you can learn a lot from, from those people and make a lo lot of good connections. So my final slide, um, when I get my mouse, is um, all about what I see myself doing um, at Boeing in the future, and also a, f a few conclusions that I have. Um, so something that has sort of come up through this talk, um, whether it be the, the coding that I mentioned, sort of learning from scratch, but just identifying that you will be continuously learning. And it's good to be proactive when you're continuously learning so that you can um, learn about different sectors, um, aviation, in uh, you know, aviation, automotive. Um, I came and did ex internships from a, a range of those different sectors to try and explore which one actually um, took my interest and it might change over time. Um, but also looking at that professional development, um, the continuous learning will really help with that, uh, whether it's you know, if you're looking to become a chartered engineer um, or just looking at, you know, making sure that you can um, promote yourself as a as a good um, engineer or a good professional. Um, it's really important to, to keep an eye on that professional development. I've sort of um, identified where I want to be now, and that's um, you know, due to the success of the graduate scheme, um, being able to rotate around those different areas has meant that I've now identified the fact that I want to stay in the sort of future concept um, field and work on the sort of more modeling and simulation aspects, as opposed to something that um, is, uh, you know, a big program going on at the moment um, where you're looking at um, the sort of more technical detailed design. This is a bit more high level and that's what I'm really interested in at the moment. And then I want to try and continue um, with my involvement in the voluntary opportunities that I've been um, engaging with, including Boeing Generation to Generation and STEM. Um, it's trying to get that balance sometimes of work and, and the voluntary stuff, but um, I, I, I hope that I can continue to do that. So just to finish off um, in the last few minutes, and um, I, I think I can join the Bo if you join the Boeing um, virtual career stand, I'll be there after the session to take any questions. Um, the three sort of pieces of advice that I would say that I've picked up since my sort of 13 months um, of my first job since graduating university um, have been exploring and finding new opportunities. Um, that second placement that I had, I wouldn't have found without me going out and talking to people and um, trying to, to explore the company more, trying new things and learning from them. Um, so whether it's a, a speaker opportunity or whether it's, you know, deciding to try out a different method um, to, to solving a problem, um, it, it's really good to be able to, to push that forward um, and give yourself that confidence in, in pushing that forward because you will learn something from it um, and whether that means that, you know, you need to try and tweak it next time or whether that's something that, you know, comes out of the team and goes, wow, you know, that was a really good idea. Um, let's try and keep that going in the future. Um, you will still get... Um, get a lot from it. And then finally, um, ask. So something that I've sort of developed throughout university and, and now throughout the two, the sort of one year and a bit that I've had on the graduate scheme is just to ask questions. Um, you'll become a lot more confident with asking those questions. But it, if you start doing that in small stages, um, you'll, you'll develop that confidence very easily. And it, it's just really, really helpful um, because you can get an answer there and then, or if someone doesn't know the answer, they can forward you on to someone else who will. Um, so the final thing that I have on there is connecting with the wider community. And this is why I think this talk in particular is a really, um, you know, I've been really grateful to be able to give this talk because it means that you can keep engaged with industry um, and 
um, groups that are around you. So they're not necessarily within the company that you're at. Um, and it gives you the opportunity to um, promote the engineering and, and do those STEM activities. Um, and then finally mentoring, which was uh, discussed in, in a really good detail um, in, this, in the uh, session before. And I can just sort of advocate for it and say that um, I, I've learned a lot from, from the mentoring relationships that I've had so far. So I hope that gave you a good overview, um, a bit of insight into what it might be like to, to join a graduate scheme, but also any sort of early career scheme. Um, as I mentioned, I will be in the, the Boeing virtual career fair um, booth after this, so I can t I'm happy to take your questions there. Um, but thank you very much for having me, Nick. Thanks very much, Isabella. So um, I'll, I'll leave you to go and join your virtual room. So thanks very much. And yeah, thanks for bearing with us. I know we had a few technical issues earlier on in the day, which has pushed us back a bit, but um, thanks very much. So Thank you. I'll, I'll um, let you get off now. Thanks a lot. So um, I'll hand straight over to to Vanessa. So, so con conscious time is ticking, which is our, our next next speaker from Safran. So I'll, I'll let Vanessa introduce. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Hey, Vanessa. Thanks. Uh, just um, to share my screen. So today's talk is going to be on the Safran UK um, graduate program. Um, I think before I start, just to signpost anyone that's interested in apprenticeships or a direct route into Safran, then we do have our virtual booth open and there's people in there ready to talk to you about both of those um, scenarios. And I'd also encourage you to visit our website where you'll find any live vacancy currently available. So um, I think it's important really just to set a bit of context around Safran for some of you that may not be so familiar with the company and to say that I'm joined on the call actually by two of our current graduates. So we have Sarah, who's one of our mechanical engineering graduates and Josie, who is our facilities management graduate. So hopefully they'll be able to share some of their experiences so far on the scheme as well. Uh, so I think Safran is a French-owned company, a global footprint across, uh, across the world, predominantly within 30 countries. We employ around 79,000 people. So it just goes to show the um, there are no real limitations on the opportunities that are available to um, individuals who join Safran. And we've got some really good um, examples of people that have joined as apprenticeship, apprentices and graduates and gone on to have um, international careers within Safran and really progressed well within the company. So I guess to start with, who are Safran? So we've got four core businesses, which is aerospace propulsion, aircraft equipment, interiors and events. And we are the world's number th uh, third biggest aerospace company with a, a revenue of 16 and a half billion pounds. These numbers were correct as of the end of 2020. And we invest an awful lot of money in R&D. You can see there that the um, expenditure was 1.2 billion pounds. And that um, resulted in over a thousand patent applications as well. So. Um, R&D and uh, continuous improvement are high up on the agenda for Safran. So I think this slide just shows you really the split in terms of revenue of um, business sector for us at Safran. So you can see it's pretty equal between the propulsion market and aircraft equipment, and then a slightly smaller chunk of the market in terms of aircraft interiors. So some um, really interesting facts and figures, actually, I'll just pick out a couple, but you can read the slide that's up. Um, so you can see one million seats are in service in airline fleets worldwide, which is incredible. And one out of every three helicopter turbine engines sold worldwide is a Safran um, engine. And more than 35,000 engines for single aisle aircraft in service worldwide. So some really interesting stats and shows the breadth and depth of what we do 
within Safran that affects each of our daily lives when we step onto an aeroplane to go on our travels. And this um, is just an indication of where we're located and the, um, the split of the footprint across the world. So you can see there's the, the biggest split really is into Europe and the US. And our key missions, I'll go into a bit more detail around these at the moment, but boosting air transport performance, enhancing protection for citizens and facilitating access into space. And this is probably one of my favorite slides that Safran have of, and it just, again, it just shows the, the breadth of what we do at Safran and the um, amount of exciting opportunities we have for people to get involved with the um, production, design, manufacturing of all these different areas of the aircraft. And I think it's really important to say that we rely heavily on our engineers and production team to ensure these are designed and manufactured well but we have an awful lot of other support functions that um support the structure of saffron so we have graduate opportunities in finance hr i mentioned josie's in facilities management um so it isn't just the engineering opportunities that we have within our our graduate scheme it goes further than that for anyone that is interested And I mentioned earlier um, how critical innovation is at Safran. So again, just a few more stats here that 16% of, so that's 79,000 people I mentioned, 16% of them are involved in R&D. And we have 1,300 what we call experts within the group. And um, a really key topic actually in the aerospace industry itself, but within Safran as well, is the pathway to successful decarbonisation. Um, and that's around our, the products we make, but also how we um, impact our daily life, how it impacts our daily lives as well. And you can see here that um, these are Safran's top priority, three top priorities. And we've got here about ultra efficient future aircraft, so lowering the fuel consumption that we use, alternative alternative fuels, overcoming those technical barriers to which will mean that we can use 100% alternative, and adapting engine and aircraft to hydrogen fuels. There was a talk earlier as well from um, my colleague at Electrical and Power around electrical um, propulsion. And you can see here that, again, one of our top priorities is that alternative propulsion. So the um, company have recently, really, or last year, released their CSR strategy for the next five years. And um, you can see here that we've, we've already mentioned decarbonisation of aeronautics, but being an exemplary employer, so... Um, making sure that we have the training and the skills and the professions ready, not just for now, but for the future as well. And that's where our grads of the future come in too. We, you know, we're focusing on your development short term, but also long term. It's really critical to us that we ensure the health and safety of employees, improving the, um, improving everyone's quality of life and making sure that there's a good work-life balance and ensuring equal opportunities and promoting diversity within the group. Embodying responsible industry, so upholding the highest standards of ethics. Um, there's a, we have some ethical guidelines within Safran that we all have to follow, no matter our position within the company. Strengthening um, our supply chain management to ensure that we're purchasing um, services and products responsibly and having a respect for the environment and natural resources, which of course, as part of the aerospace, aerospace industry, we can directly influence. And then finally, affirming our commitment to citizenship. So being at the forefront of innovations to protect the communities, developing partnerships for training and research. So we, um, we partner with a lot of universities. We have Safran University, which offers an awful lot of uh, training in various different disciplines for um, employees and enhancing professional and social integration. 
And here we can just see a few examples of um, Saffron's progress so far towards being a responsible um, a responsible company and a corporate system. And I'll, I'll let the sort of figures speak for themselves, but certainly um, responsible supply relations um, is something that's a, a large topic for our purchasing and supply chain teams. Gender equality, um, we're certainly in the UK, uh, we're part of the um, women, in, or we've signed up to the Women in Engineering Charter, and there's a lot of activities going on to encourage women into engineering and into the aerospace industry. And there's a number of standards that we have to ensure that health and safety at Saffron just doesn't just um, remain compliant, but goes above and beyond that to keep everybody safe, whether that's our employees, customers and suppliers. So I mentioned earlier about um, Saffron University and the training that provides, and you can see here that in, 20, in 2019, um, there was more than 2 million hours of training provided to the employees of Saffron to really encourage progression and development for the future um, opportunities that we will have. And Saffron, you can see it says 49% of employees are Saffron shareholders. And I'll talk a little bit more about the benefits of Saffron a little bit later on, but there is a um, company share scheme that employees are able to uh, opt into and buy shares within the company. And I also mentioned about diversity and we can see here that as of 2020, 28%, so 28% of that 79,000 people I mentioned earlier are women. And that's a figure that we're looking to grow and um, ensure more equality across the genders. So I know you're um, on this call wanting to know a little bit more about the UK graduate program. And um, so I uh, manage the scheme for the UK. And um, it's been it's been running now since 2017 as a national scheme. So has been maturing year on year and we've seen some um, brilliant graduates come through the scheme and so far we've been able to offer anyone that finishes the scheme a permanent opportunity within Saffron, which is fantastic. Um, I think the reasons for joining the Saffron scheme probably speak for themselves, but as I've mentioned earlier, one of the top innovators for the aerospace market. Um, working alongside people with world-class engineering expertise, being involved in developments um, and having the opportunity to really shape and influence where the company goes next. So a little bit more about the programme itself. It's a two-year scheme and um, it's nationwide. So you could be... Um, you could be on site at one of a number of our business units. As an example, for 2022 intake, we have four businesses across the UK that are recruiting in, uh, recruiting graduates. So that's Gloucester in the southwest, um, Pitstone near Aylesbury in the uh, southeast, Burnley um, up in the um, in the northwest, and. Um, uh, sorry, helicopter engines in Fairham, which is um, down on the south coast. So that's across our businesses of landing systems, nacelles, uh, helicopter engines, and um, electrical and power. And within the scheme, there's various disciplines that we have available, um, mechanical engineering, project management, supply chain management, so they're not all, again, they're not all necessarily um, engineering focused and some of the disciplines will um, will consider degrees of any back, uh, any degree background. Um, I'll come on a little bit more to the different vacancies in a second. But the R scheme really gives you um, a lot of stretch opportunities. So be that within the rotations you will do on your site Um there's the potential opportunity of an international placement. We've had 
previous graduates go to France, Canada, Mexico, the US. Um, that is something that would be agreed with your manager. You, you don't necessarily get to to pick where you go. It's it's definitely got to be suited to your development within the company. Um, there's various networking opportunities, but I think one of the key first networks is your graduate cohort. So the, there's nine positions available for 2022. So the other eight people that you join with, we really encourage you to build a graduate network within yourselves. And as you go through the scheme, there's a two year training plan for the softer skill side, so the communication and leadership and teamwork that runs alongside your um, placements and you'll go through all of that training as one team. So it really gives you the opportunity to strengthen that first network as well as the networks that you'll build within the business units that your, um, your placements are with and the people that you will learn from around you. Um, we're really conscious that for some people, joining Safran will be your first job and joining such a large company can be daunting so we ensure that each of our graduates is given a buddy and that buddy is from the um, graduate year above you so they will have been in the same position as you they will have experienced some of the same experiences you're going through and they are there to offer advice and support as you settle into your um your life at Safran. So just uh, just one of our ways to make you feel a bit more comfortable about joining Safran. Um, so in addition to the um, training plan that you'll do together as one group, we also do offer professional qualifications if that's suited to the, um, the department you're in, the development you're looking for. So we've had um, engineers that are progressing through IMECI or Royal Aeronauticals to become chartered engineers. Um, from the other functions, we have people that sign up to um, like a SEMA qualification for finance or CIPD for um, HR or SIPs for purchasing and supply chain. So we really encourage that your learning doesn't, your professional learning doesn't stop at your degree. That will be something that we continue to encourage during your time with Safran. And finally, um, there are a number of STEM activities that Safran are involved in. It's um, it's really important to us that we're firstly giving back into the local communities, but secondly to, again, encourage the next generation of, um, next generation of Safran employees to recognize who we are and encourage them to go down the routes of engineers and um, engineering disciplines. So these are a few things that you'll get involved in or that are offered to you. And then as an overview of what we have available in 2022. So firstly, all the roles start on the 5th of September 2022, at which point you need to have graduated from university. Um, I think I'll just highlight here as well that you must have the automatic right to work in the UK. Unfortunately, we don't offer sponsorship licenses for our graduate program. But you'll see here there's there's four separate disciplines that we're recruiting for, but in total we have nine vacancies for 2022. Um, we do have um, a high volume of applicants. So I think in 2019 we had about 800 applicants for um, seven or eight roles that year. So it is highly subscribed. We do, each person that applies will um, have communication at each step of the progress program, whether you've been successful or not. Um, and to give you a, an overview of what our application process looks like. So the initial application is via our Safran website and those applications are open now. Um, so after today, please go and have a look and see if there's anything you're interested in applying for. And that's a online application form. And it will also require you to upload a CV and covering letter. After the um, window for applications closes, you will receive a outcome of that in terms of whether you successfully pro progress to the next stage or not. And that next stage is a video interview. 
So if you successfully secure one of our video interview slots, you'll be notified by email. Um, and at that point, we will require you to share proof of right to work in the UK. There'll be a series of questions for you to answer via an online platform and, the, and you're given around a month to complete those and they fall over the Christmas period. So we open them mid-December and we expect them to be completed by mid-January. So then following the video interviews is when we select the candidates to come through to assessment centres. Again, you'll be notified by email if you've successfully secured a place at one of those assessment centres. And um, at, on the day, there's a number of competencies that we'll be assessing, communication, professional integrity, relationship building, um, taking action and analytical and strategic understanding. And we assess those over a number of different um a number of different assessments. So there's a team building activity, there's a um, there's a written piece of work for you to complete, an interview, a presentation. So hopefully it gives everyone the opportunity to um, put their best self forward. And following the assessment centres, we aim to notify everyone of the outcome within two weeks of attendance. So we make sure that we'll, we're communicating each stage to ensure you know where you are within the, within the process. And then in terms of the benefits, um, so the starting salary for one of our graduates is 27,000 a year. Um, we have an employee assistance program available, um, which offers um, support and counselling should you require it and every single employee of Saffron UK is signed up to that and then it's obviously optional if and when you would require to use that. Um, we have the company share scheme which I mentioned earlier so um, normally that, off that offer is open four times a year and for the uh, value of shares that you purchase within Saffron, the company will then add another 60% to those shares, um, which is a, a huge benefit and something that is very popular within Saffron. Uh, I've talked about the training programme already. Um, there is the option for you to um, have health cover with the company. Um, through, through a third party supplier to provide sort of the general health cover for things like um, glasses, dentistry work, etc. But more information would be provided on that if you were successful. Um, like a number of companies following, um, following COVID, we've certainly moved to more of a flexible and hybrid working model. I've, asterisk, I've just put an asterisk next to that because it will be dependent on the work that you're uh, recruited to do and the, the role you're, you're undertaking. Um, we have a benefits platform coming, so that will offer um, a number of discounts and ways of shopping that will um, make everyone's money go a bit further for all employees of Saffron UK. There's a cycle to work scheme, and uh, I've mentioned it a couple of times now, but I think it is important about the um, professional qualification support. So that's financial and um, the time off that we would support to, to allow you to complete those. And so I'll just stop sharing my screen now because I think I'll just hand over to Josie and um, Sarah to see if they want to add anything. From there it's okay. They're, they're Can you see us? <laughs> oh, no. We are having to oh, social yeah. distance. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, just following on from what Vanessa's been saying, that you do get to go on different placements, which is really good for a graduate scheme. I did that. I'm on the facilities uh, graduate scheme, and I'm in the facilities department as well as the health and safety department the purchasing department um so that's i think a really good it allows you to try different opportunities in different departments this is there um yeah 
I mean, I without the graduate scheme, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to in areas of engineering I didn't know about before. So the to do with systems engineering, which is never something I'd heard of or considered, but it turns out I actually really enjoy it and I'm actually quite good at it. So I might actually keep forward. So no, it's been good. Thank you both. I think um, a couple of things that you touched on there, actually, that uh, someone asked me earlier for some advice on being a graduate or successfully being a graduate at Safran. And I think my advice to them was to have an open mind in terms of the opportunities that are given to you. Yeah, be definitely. yourself. Absolutely be yourself. That's who we want to see. So that's through the assessment centres and then... Um, when you join Safran, we um, yeah we want to know who you are as a person, and then thirdly, again it's around opportunities, but take hold of any opportunity that comes your way at Safran because it will be absolutely worthwhile. And if there's something that you think could be changed, could be improved, then speak to someone and run with it because certainly around. Um, our carbon neutral strategies. We are always looking for new options and new insights in terms of what Safran can do. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to talk today. And I hope that's given everyone a bit more of an insight into what Safran does and our graduate scheme. And I'll remind you again that the applications are open on the website currently. And there is also a brochure within the portal um, that's been uploaded where you'll find a bit more detail about the Safran scheme that you may or may not have heard today um, and that's got the details of minimum expectations for each of the roles we have available there's also an email address on there should you have any questions but I'll be heading back into the virtual room now so if anyone does want to follow me over there and have any specific questions then um, I'll see you over there in a few minutes but thank you ever so much Nick for giving Safran this opportunity today Thank you. It's not a problem. That's not a problem. Thanks, guys. Um, appreciate it. So do go and have a chat to Safran. I'll say go and have a chat to them. They've got live vacancies, so I really would. <laughs> so thanks ever so much. And yeah, we'll hand straight over now um, to our next speakers. So that's going to be uh, Martin Baker. So just thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Vanessa. Bye. OK. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Martin Baker's presentation. Uh, my name is Ollie. I'm a graduate systems engineer and I've done various placements with the company before. And I'm Ellie, a senior environmental test engineer and I've been at Martin Baker for two and a half years. So today I'm going to talk to you a bit about what we do, uh, where we've come from as a company, what opportunities we have for you and also give you an insight into the journeys that we've had that have led us to Martin Baker. Um, hopefully we will also be able to instill a technical interest in our product in you, uh, but Bear with us as our technical skills are almost certainly miles above our presentation skills. Um, there was a previous presentation this morning. It's going to be very similar, uh, but we're different presenters, so it'll have a new flair on it. Uh, I think the slides for you are over to the left, but for us, they're at the front. So if we're looking over here, that's why. So, Sir so James Martin uh, started a company, and he was born in 1893 in a small town called Crossgar in Ireland. He was the only son of a farmer and he received only a basic education as it was assumed he'd take over the family farm. His father died when he was two and he taught himself engineering skills, which he then used to start up this business. Uh, he inspired loyalty from the staff and he also enraged the bureaucrats who tried to control his work. And uh, he has a long list of accolades. So for services to engineering, he's received an OBE in 1950, a CBE in 1957, he was knighted in 1965. He's a Royal Aerospace Society Honorary Fellow, and he was also um, awarded the Wakefield Gold Medal in 1952 for advances in aviation safety. So originally, the company was called Martin Aircraft Works, and uh, where Sir Martin designed and manufactured aircraft until a tragic fatal incident in uh, September 1942 involving the MB3 aircraft and his best friend and company test pilot, Captain Valentine Baker who experienced an engine failure and subsequently crashed. The company was renamed in honour of Captain Valentine Baker, 
who prior to this had served in all three armed forces and survived nine months active service in France with the Royal, <coughs> sorry, the Royal Flying Corps. He'd uh, gained a military cross and an Air Force cross, and he'd returned to civilian life in 1921 and became a flying instructor, teaching, amongst others, James Martin and Amy Johnson. So Martin Baker isn't just limited to Uxbridge. We work with 81 countries uh, with over 16.5 thousand seats in service. So the company's recently redefined our vision to align with what we believe is important for the future. For us, a good employee will not only be interested in the product and have a passion for knowledge, but also demonstrate the six core values, which are professionalism, understanding, teamwork, humility, accountability, and integrity. These values are required for us to achieve our mission of providing customers with the best possible product that can be manufactured, which in turn leads to loyalty, trust, and allows us to reach our vision of being the global provider of choice for the world's most advanced ejection seats, crashworthy seats, and associated safety systems. Here's an example of what we do. So at best, um, even the best engineering in the world still can go wrong, and we're the last line of defense between failure and fatality. So in the video, you can see a Canadian Hornet, which is piloted by uh, Brian Buse, who's in the Mark 14 NASIS seat. He was practicing in high alpha pass for an air show in Alberta, Canada in July 2010, where the uh, right engine quit uh, whilst the left engine was still at high thrust. Luckily, Brian managed to eject at low altitude with a high angle of attack. He walked away with no significant injuries, as you can see from the video. Um, and as you can see from the video, this, this kind of incident is not one that you could, you could, that you could walk away from. It's not survivable. Um, and unfortunately, you can't hear the, vid the, the sound in the video, but funnily enough, the song playing in the background at the air show at the time was Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. So on this slide, you can see some of the products that we offer. So starting with the crew escape systems, there's ejection seats, which actually remove the occupant of the aircraft. Uh, however, to achieve this, we have to also remove the aircraft canopy from the ejection seat path. Uh, this can be done in a number of ways such as using rockets to fire it off first, which is known as canopy jettison, or miniature detonating cord, which blows the transparency up, or even using canopy breakers, which can be seen at the top of this seat, uh, which punch through the canopy as the seat rises up. The interseat sequencing system in twin seat aircraft ensures the seats don't eject at the same time, and both pilots are ejected, even if only one pulls the ejection handle. Um, Ground egress is to remove the canopy without firing the ejection seat if the occupant needs to get out following a crash or a fire. Uh, we also do crew systems and these are additional components that we produce, some of which help the occupants in a number of post ejection scenarios. So survival items are included in the seat survival kit along with water and food. Uh, tree escape systems can help an occupant lure themselves to the ground after parachuting into a tree. And also in some situations, it just isn't viable to eject such as with helicopters or large fixed wing aircraft. So we also manufacture seats which are designed to absorb an impact rather than escape from it. So since its inception, Martin Baker has continuously evolved our ejection seats. Uh, we've, the major innovations are highlighted uh, in the blue circles. Originally, the seat would be fired out and the occupant would then have to unstrap themselves and pull their parachute. Uh, the Mark II and III introduced automatic parachute deployment from the seat. You'd have to strap into both uh, the seat harness and the parachute harness. By the Mark V, there was a combined harness uh, where you'd only have to strap into one and the harness itself would be released from the seat. The Mark VII introduced the underseat rocket motor, which gives extra for us to get the required altitude for parachute inflation when the aircraft is slow and low. Uh, the Mark VIII introduced harness retraction to help put the occupant in a better position prior to ejection. Arm restraint was added at Mark 10, which reduced uh, the chance of injury. Uh, NACES, which was the seat you saw earlier, introduced electronic sequencing over a purely mechanical system, which allowed for greater control of the ejection sequence. Twin guns were incorporated into the Mark 16s, which improved catapult performance, reliability, and also decreased the weight as the guns now formed part of the seat structure. The US 16E, which is this one, uh, has auto eject capability and neck, prote neck protection devices to prevent head and neck injuries. And Mark 18 is currently in development and has pitch control as the rocket motor is allowed to rotate. This enhances stability of the seat following cockpit, em cockpit emergence, hereby mitigating head movement. 
So as mentioned in previous slides, Martin Baker also works on crashworthy seats, which opens up a whole different section of the industry. Each different aircraft is designed for a different mission and the crashworthy seats are adapted to help fulfill whatever role that's required. For example, the seat in the top left is clearly designed to protect the occupant from gunfire, whereas that is not required for a large fixed wing aircraft, which has a requirement for a more spatially efficient and adaptive seating. One of the main challenges in supporting ejection throughout the flight envelope. <coughs> on the left are images from the ejection video you saw earlier. The image on the right is Martin Pert of the RAF in Kandahar, Afghanistan in 2009. An incident caused the hard landing, which collapsed the landing gear and caused the fire. He decided it was safer to eject as opposed to remaining in the aircraft, which was weapons loaded. From this example, you can see that these are quite demanding situations for an escape system due to the low altitude. These are some of the challenges we battle against when designing the best system. For example, if you eject a high altitude where oxygen levels are low, the seat contains a backup oxygen tank and will not deploy the parachute until you are at an oxygen safe altitude. Also, the occupant mass makes a large difference to the ejection seat performance, which you'll see more on in the next slide. Uh, so humans are not optimally configured for high rates of acceleration, wind blast or impact and have physiological limitations. The limitations for light occupants uh, dictate the performance you can achieve for a heavy occupant. Uh, you can see how dramatic the range of occupants we accommodate is from the images on the slide. Uh, this affects the ejected mass and center of gravity and hence the seat performance. Uh, so due to Newton's second law of forces mass times acceleration, if a large occupant makes the ejected mass twice that of the small occupant, then the acceleration will be halved. It's the same force as provided by the catapult and the underseat rocket motor in each case. There's only so much acceleration the human body can withstand. Other human factors considerations are the cockpit design, including lower limb clearance and reached controls, and a, a number of cockpit trials are conducted to ensure anthropometric accommodation is optimal. Some of these issues are solved with parachute deployments, uh, which is a more complex system than you might think. So as you can see on the side, we've got a 28 feet diameter aeroconical design for the parachute, and it can accommodate a large suspended mass range and provides a descent velocity of less than 24 feet per second, uh, which is equivalent to jumping from a nine feet platform with no parachute. Uh, so all in all, the modern ejection seat is a complex autonomous air vehicle system designed to meet demanding requirements and is not simply a catapult. System complexity is driven by aircraft design, crew boarding range and physiological limits, crew equipment and increasingly stringent injury criteria. So this video gives an example of one of the many ways that we test our seats. The video shows a 450 knot test on an F-35 US 16 E seat, uh, which is one of the latest and greatest production seats from Martin Baker. From the moment the ejection handle is pulled, you'll be uh, under a parachute in less than one second, and that can happen at speeds of up to 520 miles an hour. So there are over 30 subsystems at play during the ejection sequence, and the main subsystems are highlighted in red, and these take place in under half a second. From left to right in the image, you can see the transparency removal, underseat rocket motor initiation, and finally the parachute deployment and, and the seat occupant separation. As much as I'd love to, I can't talk through the entire sequence, but if you're interested, please uh, follow up after this uh, video and we'll be, we'll be happy to have a conversation and answer any questions. <clears throat> so moving on to the career opportunities, uh, it's the skilled people that make our product possible and ensure we deliver a product, a product that works first time, every time. Uh, Martin Baker are always looking for new talent to join our business. We have many early career opportunities for those with a genuine interest in the product to learn all about it. And we also offer a range of opportunities for people starting off their careers in the aerospace industry. So apprenticeships are a four year structured pro uh, program which features a large range of possible personal and professional development opportunities. Uh, so HND, HNC, sponsored degree. Uh, there are also team building events throughout the year and several apprentices have gone on to make their careers at Martin Baker, working in a range of departments from human engineering to mechanical design. There are summer placements in a range of departments as well, such as systems, the design office, human engineering, seat test, uh, so on. And uh, it's a great way to find out if Martin Baker is a company for you. Applications run throughout the year and positions are offered when a suitable candidate is found. 
There are also paid year in industries. Uh, this is something that I did, uh, where you do a 12 month placement within a department. Uh, applications are open now and close on the 7th of January. You'll be working on actual projects and interacting with customers, and you'll hear a little bit more about what I did in a few slides' time. So as mentioned on the first slide, uh, we now have over 1,000 employees, and we've also added 200 engineering staff in the last five years alone. We are a rapidly growing business with an ever-growing customer base. There are currently vacancies in mechanical engineering, environmental test, production engineering, software engineering, uh, seat test, systems engineering, and so on. All of our current vacancies can be found on our website, and we can give you more information in the chat room after this presentation. Uh, if you're interested, even if you don't feel that you're an exact fit for these positions, please do join and have a chat with us. So this slide gives a brief insight into my journey uh, into Martin Baker. I've always had a passion for engineering, hence I studied mechanical engineering at university during which I completed a year in industry and was also a member of the Formula student team. Prior to coming to Martin Baker, I worked at various automotive companies and the transition to working on aircraft systems was seamless as there was an abundance of help from the department. Since joining Environmental Test, I've worked on eight different projects. And the reason it's worth mentioning this is that sometimes you can be stuck at a company whereby you're stuck working on the same project for years. I've also had the opportunity to work with numerous external test houses, which is important as you learn to build a professional relationship with leading test houses in the country. What's fun about Martin Baker is that besides the fact that you work on ejection seats, you also have the opportunity to witness live ejections. Martin Baker owned two Meteor jets, which are used for testing. And for all of you wondering whether or not we use live humans for testing, we don't, but we used to. And if you Google the name Bernard Lynch or look into the company history, you'll find some interesting videos on YouTube. What I've enjoyed most about being at Martin Baker is the autonomy and the high level of responsibility throughout the project and the ability to propose new ideas that directly affect the success of the, of the program. Uh, so for me, uh, at college, I studied STEM subjects and I enjoyed them all. So a teacher suggested engineering as a possible route for me to pursue. I actually only gained a specific interest in aerospace around this time and I was lucky enough that it did turn out uh, that this was the right choice for me. So I applied to the University of Leeds and started my degree in 2016, uh, with the first two years being a more generic engineering than aerospace. Regardless, I knew I wanted to do a year in industry and also in this subject area to ensure I was making the right choice, as well as adding to my employability, so I made some applications. I heard about Martin Baker on Gradcracker and also through a gross family friend and applied for systems engineering, as it's a very multidisciplinary role. I had a really fantastic year and got to do things above and beyond a normal placement. So the picture on, on the slide is me on my way on a one-day trip to deliver a presentation to Aero Vodashodi in Czechia on the company King Air. Uh, I returned to Leeds after finishing my year in industry uh, to finish my degree. And I also completed an integrated master's with my main project on aerodynamic analysis of a historic fatal hydroplane crash. Uh, I reapplied to Martin Baker for a graduate role as I couldn't see how I'd prefer another company. And I'm currently three months in and happily working on a variety of interesting projects. So here on our social media slide, you can see the different ways that people interact with Martin Baker. We're reaching nearly 40,000 followers across five social media platforms on a regular basis. The Martin Baker brand has over 9.5 million impressions on people across all six channels over the past 12 months. Each of these channels serves a different purpose 